Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten, the show where a team of DMs teams up to tackle a 100% rules as written exploration of D&D's classic Gothic horror campaign. I am Dragna Carta, your host and DM, and a big thank you to everyone for continuing to tune in, as well as a thank you to our cast and players for uh, continuing to tune in after uh, what this campaign did to them last week. We yeah, appreciate that, you guys. Actually, I'd reply, but I'm unconscious. So. Yeah. Actually, yeah. we've decided to unionize. We're uh, going to be hiring a new DM fairly soon, so have a nice last session. He's going to kill you now, just for... Just, <laughs> just die. <So. laughs> Hold He's going to kill you not, for real. Someone's like, knocking yeah, at my door. I'll be back shortly. Yeah. That chainsaw you hear in the background, it's Dragna. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, with that, as I, I promise not to chainsaw too many PCs, uh, but with that, I think that's all we got for now. I think we're good to get started. So uh, with that, thank you again to everyone for returning this week, and let's get started with Curse of Strahd, Twice Bitten. A striking elven female with an almost ritualized poise, Kiva Cyrilai always endeavors to be a level-headed mediator and a soothing presence in the lives of all she meets. Determined to look ever forward, she relies on controlling day-to-day -day chaos. Anyone who watches her for long enough, however, can clearly see there's something undeniably feral and unpredictable bubbling under the surface. In the company of these fine strangers, he is just Metreon. But across the Sword Coast, he's known as Metreon the Magnificent. He is a tiefling whose body and dress carry the signatures of a nomadic performer, as evidenced by the rougher edges of his costume and his sinewy frame covered in faded tattoos. Though he may not look like a typical magician, rest assured, he cleans up quite handsomely. The well-dressed, well-spoken half-elf who introduced herself as Lilisen has stayed away from the rest of the traveling group during the journey so far. Oh, she's friendly enough if someone strikes up a conversation with her. Charming, even. But left to her own devices, she invariably keeps to herself, and even looks nervous when anyone comes within ten feet of her. Amity, a terrifying deviloid with a tail that will knock your drink over if she gets too excited. Even worse, some pig follows her around and eats almost as much as she does. Yet, she's generous and easy to befriend, especially if you get her talking about her book of fables. Just, if she compares you to a fox, it's hard to tell if that's a compliment. Erythrindir is a high elf man who looks perpetually like he's never quite gotten enough sleep. After his departure from elven society, he found himself out in the wilderness, working as a ranger in the deep, deep woods. However, this did little to quell his passion for history, and he's found himself on the road to Neverwinter, hoping to track down a book that might hold the answer to a question he's held for a long, long time.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So, I think we're about ready to jump right in. So, with that, last we left off on Curse of Strahd, Twice Bitten. Our motley crew had met on the long road to Neverwinter when they were spirited away to a dark and unfamiliar land. There, from a letter clutched in a dead man's fist, they learned that they had come to the shadowed land of Barovia, the domain, they learned, of a powerful vampire. The characters fled the dark woods for a dreary village that lay beneath the shadow of a dark and twisted castle. There, a supernatural fog and the pleas of two children pushed them into the old Durst house, soon trapping them inside. Within the house, these travelers learned that they had been lured into the haunted manor of an ancient cult. By their wit and will, however, the party made their way down to the basement below, where the monster at the heart of the malevolent structure lay in wait. Their exploration led them to a mist-shrouded, blood-stained altar, and there, they were met by thirteen apparitions that demanded a living sacrifice. Lillison, however, defied the spirits of the cult in her own way, awakening and angering the cultist's beast, Lorgoth the Decayer. The party fled this shambling mound, exorcising the spirit of Thornbolt Durst, and escaped for the house above. Though Lillison, left alone with the Decayer, found her own life cut short. She was, however, resurrected when a dark and mysterious assembly of entities greeted her and offered her life anew, if she consented to their terms. She did, and so was raised from death to join the others. To their horror, however, as they emerged from the dungeons below, the party found that the upper floors of the house had become a death trap flooded with toxic fog, infested with rabid swarms of rats, and blocked by doorway after doorway of deadly scything blades. Through their own courage and quite a bit of blood, each of them escaped alive, though with many left unconscious or even deeply wounded by their efforts. And so... Erthrandir. Mist swirls across the ground as you find yourself standing on the third story balcony of the Durst house. You can hear a thin constant drizzle that begins to form puddles on the ground below the muddy earth giving way to slick wet cobblestones as you had seen before. The fog that you had seen previously that had ushered you into the house has receded now leaving visible the tall shapes of village dwellings. The windows of each house stare out from pools of blackness, no sound cutting the silence, save for a mournful sobbing that echoes through the streets from a distance. Your gaze is drawn to a deep shadow that looms over the village, and as your vision drifts upward, you can see the castle again from before, a dark, twisted structure its spires arcing through the overcast clouds like a lance, piercing the clouded, darkening sky. And as you look around at the four unconscious bodies of your companions, you realize night is coming soon. Erthrandir, having is going to, having taken on this Vista, and realizing that for the moment he appears to be out of danger, he's just going to flop down onto the balcony, setting his back against the railing, and for about a few minutes just let out all the breath he'd been saving. He then looks around at his four unconscious companions, and then kind of almost looks at Amity and realizes that Truffle is still with her and attempts to extricate her, him from her grip. As you do, you look toward her body to see if you can find the pig. And as you do, you hear a soft 
oinking from behind you and feel something rubbing against the back side of your uh, calf. Glancing behind, you notice that evidently during your uh, time gathering your breath, Truffle has managed to find himself behind you. And as you look up, you hear him snuffle quietly with concern as he presses his snout up against your pant leg and looks up at you with big, dark eyes. Hey, little guy. I, uh... Man, you should not be this friendly towards me. I tried to make you bacon. Despite this, he reaches down to scratch him behind the ears and then looks around. Does it look like that he's out of, out of immediate danger for the moment? Like, does it look like the smoke's going to leak further out of the house or anything like that? As you look around, seeing if there's any indication, you hear the sound of the blades abruptly stop. The final scythe echoing with a metallic slam. And as you turn behind you, you see them dissolve, forming the shape of a familiar parlor door that then slams shut behind you. I... What? You... All right, then. Did you not get what you wanted? Were we bad house guests? Terribly sorry about that. He then realizes he's talking to himself and stops. Not wanting to go back inside the house again, he is going to look at the four bodies, look at Truffle, and then start rooting through people's bags. He's trying to see if anyone has any rope or anything that might be like rope in order to actually get these folks down. All right. Does anyone else possess any kind of rope? Nope. No. Do uh, bed sheets count? Yeah. Isn't there still that bed sheet rope that we uh, tied to the balcony here and then like rolling pin wedged upstairs? Yes, that is still present. You can see it kind of dangling a bit loosely from the upper floor. It actually seemed to have caught snagged between two bricks. You can see that the end of it that was inside seems to have just been sheared off by perhaps the closing of that window. It's yeah. kind of just fluttering faintly in the chill, stagnant air. Coming up empty-handed, he looks at it, sighs, and then reaches up to grab it. He's then going to tie one end around the sturdiest bit of the banister he can find. And, or actually, does the parlor door open in or out? Like the parlor door? Or, yeah. Uh, I believe it would open uh, inward. Okay, in that case, he's going to tie it around the door handle, since that's probably more stat, probably more sturdy than the railing. And looking that, looking around, he's going to do his best to tie the other end around Lillison in as sturdy a sort of harness as he can manage. All right, as you do, Lillison, I will need you to make two rolls for me. First, oh I will need you to roll 1d20, please. That is a seven. All right. Very good. As you look over Lillison's unconscious body, you notice that there appears to be a bit of blood leaking from part of her tunic where the uh, shirt is kind of lifted up and as you look over the place and try to tie the rope there you see a large purplish bruise almost colored black in places this cut seems to be superficial but there does appear to be a greater wound within because he you'll have to be tender with it okay he's going to wince seeing this and then bear as carefully as he can finish tying the harness around her and once he's done so, he's going to do his best to haul, to, like, pick her up, and as best he can, gently, gently lower her down to the street below. He murmuring all the while, Oh, sure, the store, they say, Oh, no, you won't need a block and tackle on a camping trip. It'll just weigh you down. Why would you need that? And says similar things as he continues kind of trying to lower her to the street. 
All right, she is slowly lowered to the ground, making use of an abundance of the uh, sheet and blanket tied rope as you slowly and carefully lower her body to the ground. Okay. It takes some time and some difficulty, but eventually she is find, you find her hanging perhaps five feet above the cobblestone below. Okay. He's then going to look at the knot, look at the bedsheet rope, gulp, and start climbing down at himself. And once he's at the ground, he's going to gingerly untie her and lay her on the cobblestones and then climb back up to do the same for the rest of his companions. All right, uh, Lulison, if you could roll 1d4 for me, please. That is a two. Thank you. Uh, Erthrandir, you are able to successfully return to the balcony. Who are you taking next? Uh, I'd say probably in order of weight, so probably Metreon. All right, Metreon, I will need you to roll 1d20 for me, please. That's going to be an 18. An 18, very good. Looking over Metreon's body, you can see that he does appear to have a long cut over his collarbone where part of the tunic has been separated by the sides. But overall, it doesn't appear to be too bad of a wound. It might scar, but you think it'll heal in time. Okay, that's very good news. He's going to do the same thing for him and gingerly lower him down. All right. And he slowly descends in the same manner as a little synth that over much difficulty. Yep. And then visibly panting at this point. This is not his cup of tea. He's going to climb up and try and do the same thing for Amity. All right. Uh, Amity, if you will uh, roll 1d20 for me, please. That's a three. All right. Looking over Amity's body, you realize that a large cut has been pulled across the back of her ankle and lower foot. There's a lot of blood seeping from it, and though you've managed to tie it off, it looks in bad shape. He groans, and then kind of... And then seeing there's not much he can do here, he's going to tie her off and lower her down. <laughs> Actually, no. He's going to have a realization. And then, and so he kind of takes Amity and Kiva's packs, pulls them off their shoulders, and just drops them into the street below. Why did I not do that the first time? That, like, I... Wow. Work smarter, not harder. Rule one. But yeah, and then he's going to tie off Amity and lower, and then come back with Kiva. All right, and Kiva, you're able to slowly lower down without over much difficulty, though the weight does pose a bit of a challenge to you. Yeah, but he eventually, is. and with much sweating and trembling, you're able to successfully pull it off. All right, then going back up for Truffle, and gingerly lowering himself down the rope. All right, with that, you touch down on the ground, the rope fluttering in the chill breeze behind and beside you, with nothing more than the quiet, empty cobblestone street before you. Okay. He's going to look at the four others and then kind of drag them to the other side of the street from Death House, which he throws fearful glances back at every so often. Does it look normal? No more, like, from the front? No more scythe blades and poison gas or anything. Make a perception check. Alrighty. That is a four. As far as you can tell, it's dark and there's a bit of mist around the ground floor, though. It doesn't approach the main fog, but as far as you can tell, it seems just like a darkened house. Okay. He is still dragging them several houses away as best he can. And then, once he does, he's going to kind of sit down for a moment, get his bearings. And then, 
Does it look like these guys are going to wake up anytime soon, or do they look well and truly out? Uh, I will need everyone else other than Lilithan to roll 1d4. Um, also, does anyone still have any hit dice remaining and wish to spend them over a short rest? Yes. Yes. Uh, n no, I don't think so. Yes. All right. Uh, with that, in that case, uh, Amity, Lilithan and Metron look likely to wake up within the next 45 minutes or so, but Kiva looks out cold. Okay. In that case... Kiva, what did you roll? I rolled a one. Uh, she should wake up in a bit of time, but you're unsure exactly how long. But the others should wake up reasonably soon. Okay. Herthrandir... Wait, why did my constitution... Kind of realizing that things are all right for the moment is going to kind of set truffle down gingerly and then look around the village and see if you can find anywhere that looks like it has lights on looking around uh i would say if you'd like you can spend you know a good five minutes walking up and down to look to take 20 or you can just take a quick glance uh i think he's a little panicked we'll go for the quick glance right now Right. That's a natural one. Pretty much all of the houses have boarded up or shuttered windows. It, given the the mist and just the drizzle falling, it's difficult to tell which ones may be illuminated and which ones would not be. This whole place is a ghost town. I I that I, I should have known. Maybe the whole town's a trap. He kind of seeing this, he's going to just kind of go up to one of the houses, regardless of which, and start banging on the door. Hey! Come on, I, is there anybody in there? We need a doctor, a priest, somebody. Just please, open up. All right, the first house you approach, uh, the one directly around the corner from where you're currently keeping the others, uh, actually seems quite old and decrepit. You can see that the door is hanging half-heartedly from its rusted hinges, the door frame almost swollen around it. Um, it doesn't look very lived in. He's going to sigh and then kind of walk back to the others. You said it's raining. Uh, it's a light drizzle. It's not, you know, drenching or anything, but it's just, just unpleasant enough to make your clothes, clothes a bit, you know, sodden and damp. A bit of mist just to make you feel a bit of a shiver. Okay. Erthrandir is going to rummage around in his own pack, pull out the tarp that he's been sleeping under in lieu of a tent, and do his best to kind of drape it over everyone's bodies who he's propped up against a wall, kind of shielding them from the rain. And then he's going to pull that over himself and truffle if he allows him and kind of sit with them and wait for them to wake up. He doesn't really want to leave them alone in this town, even to, you know, go a few blocks away. You and feel, as you talk him closer, you feel Truffle kind of snuggle up to you on the side, his little form shivering slightly. Hey there, little buddy. I, yeah, no, it's real cold, isn't it? But, uh, it's better than being in there. I I'm glad you uh, made it out. I uh, I stand by what I said, but uh, I'm glad I didn't have to kill you. Both for and my say, both for your sake, and uh, because I'm pretty sure Amity would have ripped out my teeth. <laughs> and yeah, then he's going to settle down, keeping a nervous eye on the Durst house all the while and wait. Truffle looks up at you with big, dark, uh, not understanding animal eyes. <laughs> the meaning of your words sliding off of him, but as he just looks up at you intently, and then he stands up, slowly turns around in a circle, his little curly tail bobbing behind him, and then plops down beside you once again, burying his snout beneath the fabric of your tunic. Earthen Deer chokes up a little, but other kind of scratches his head and continues his watch. Another 30 minutes go by, and you hear 
a soft groan and stirring from Metreon, then Lilithin and Amity soon following. Uh, 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 Metreon, feeling like a coldness on his face, just instinctively goes to wipe it, um, and he his eyes start to flutter open, and he's looking around and. They immediately go wide as he realizes he's not in that fucking house anymore. Uh, and he starts looking around. Oh, oh, holy shit. Holy shit. I'm out. And uh, he immediately goes in, like, as he sees Amity start to wake up, he like, scoops her up and, like, hugs her. Uh, and then draws back and instinctively goes to hug Lillison since he sees her waking up, but then realizes and then pivots back and then hugs Amity again. Welcome back to the land of the living. I was afraid you weren't, weren't going to be rejoining us. Uh, how do we get out? Uh. Uh, barely. I, uh, we, after you got, you all got knocked out, uh, Amity, Lillison, and I managed Wait, wait, wait. What? What? And he starts, and Metron starts to point at Lillison. The fuck is that? Is she a I... fucking ghost? And, uh, he starts to reach for his dagger or crossbow, just panicked. Hey, 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 hey. Calm down. Calm down. She's alive. She's breathing. I checked. What you I, mean she's breathing? I mean, I mean like... Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> should... Uh, hold on. Mm. Uh, all right. Apparently, I can't breathe very deeply. That hurts a lot. Ah. Yeah, I think you've got some broken ribs or something. I thought he was dead. No, I didn't die. Yeah, I, she just came up from behind us and out of the basement. I'm very happy you made it. Yeah, the apologies for the delay. Oh, I think I just blacked out down there for a moment. Uh, well, I uh, don't think any of us can blame you. But uh, how about me, you, Metreon? You feeling all right? Like, I, you didn't look too badly hurt when I was lowering you down, but uh, you never know with the internal stuff. I mean, my back is fucking killing me. Uh, and he starts to rub where uh, the first blade sliced down his shoulders. And then uh, was, he starts to wipe away some of the blood from his collar where his tunic was split. Well, at least, at least my... And he starts to show off the pendant that he still has. Does the pendant look the same? Like, there's no... Or does he still have it? I mean, like, was it an apparition too? Uh, do you mean the pendant that you took from the jewelry box? Yeah, the pendant and the gold rings that he had. They seem to be unaffected and still on your person. Uh, he kisses the, the, the pendant. Oh. <sighs> Looks like we still got this then. Whatever those fucking blades were, they ain't, they ain't fucked this up too hard. How, how did we get down here, though? Oh, I, uh, I lowered you down. I used that bed sheet rope and a bit of engineering to take you down one by one, climb back up, do the same thing. Damn thing nearly snapped, though. I uh, First thing I do when we're, we get out here and get into a general store, I'm buying some actual rope. Yeah, cheers. Thanks a lot. Uh, and Metreon looks over at Amity and starts to kind of like, sees that maybe she's a little sluggish in the wake, uh, but then starts to push, uh, like push her shoulder in. Oi. Love, you good? Amity, as oh. he pushes you, you feel a sudden pain lancing through your lower leg. And looking down, you realize you can't feel your right foot. Yeah, I, I like, <clears throat> try to stand up, but then just, like, crumple to the ground. Uh, <sighs> oh, God. What, what happened? I, holy shit, are you... What? I, you, we, you're, you. My foot is like bent away from the leg. Um, oh, no. Oh, fuck me. Oh. Um, I, I, oh here, sit down, sit down, come on. Yeah, don't put your weight on it. Get over here. All right, all right. It, what, what happened? Well, uh, you took a heroic dive through the blades and got hit straight on. Oh, God. Yeah. You're we, alive, though. That's something. We, we all made it out. Yep, everybody. 
Keep us alive. Oh, oh, good. All right. Let's... Let's go get some food in the town and then get out of here. I, uh... Don't think we're gonna have much luck there. I, uh... There might be folks living here, but from what little I saw, this place is, seems almost abandoned. Well, fuck. You didn't see no inn or nothing. I I didn't really look. I didn't want to go too far from y'all. There might be something. We saw but, yeah. a tavern on our way in, did we not? It was boarded up at the time, but perhaps now. Worth a shot. Then DM, we... now that... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, I was just going to ask, now that I'm awake, uh, can I see if any other, like, buildings have lights on or if there seem to be any occupants? Mickey, are you, like, making your way around and looking through the area? Or are you No, I'm just just, just from where I'm at. Just from where I'm at. Make a perception check for me. Uh, 11. 11? Looking around... Uh, from your current position, um, you do notice that um, there is a house uh, toward the main uh, avenue that cuts through town that just appear to have a slight bit of light seeping through its windows. Uh, there's a there's a house over there. Looks like it's got lights on. Oh, that's something. At, at minimum, they can point us to a priest or a doctor or something. Don't go inside. I have. <laughs> you don't got to tell us twice, love. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm trusting a building till I'm back at my cabin, frankly. Speaking of which, uh, on our way out, y'all still down to burn this place down, like uh, from afar. I, I don't, I don't care at this point. I just want to fucking leave. Uh, DM. Do we see the mists? Are they still pervasive? Are they still swarming around everything? No, they're just, I mean, there are small, you know, little stragglers of mist that are just kind of floating across the ground, but it's not anywhere close to the thick uh, boiling fog that you saw earlier. It just seems to be, you know, little cloudlets isolated from each other. Uh, Looks that fucking mist is gone. Yeah. I- Hey, uh, Randy, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, maybe just go knock on the door, see if anyone's in there who can help us. Uh, right. I'll, I can join you, but I got to... And uh, Metreon sort of motions to his face, uh, pointing to some of the smeared makeup that's now run down his face and uh, his hair. I just got right, to touch a bit. Right, right, yeah. Good, good idea. Uh, and Yeah. And make sure that she... Uh, he kind of nods at Amity. Make sure she's all right, all right? And he's going to then walk towards the lighted house. All right. Erythrindir, you slowly make your way toward the house. It seems to punch in on itself, almost as though it's desperate to sink into the muddy dirt of the road. You can see that several wooden shingles have fallen to the ground over time, with several dozen more dangling from the roof as their rusted nails threaten to snap. Um, But what you can see through the dark, boarded-up windows are faint flickering lights that a faint one that faintly bobs and scurries behind the windows like a skittering rodent. There is a homely, reasonably well-kept door that stands cl- closed shut at the front of the structure. Okay. He's going to kind of brush his sodden hair out of his eyes, stand up straight and politely knock. What is your passive perception? 11. All right. You hear the sound of footsteps abruptly stop on the interior, and then nothing. Um, excuse me. I I don't mean to bother, but my friends and I ran into a good bit of trouble. We were, uh, the house we were in got burnt down, or, and we, uh, we, we need to know where the nearest place to stay is. I I, I promise we're not going to impose. We're not going to come in. I just would like some information. I, If you don't mind, ma'am, or sir, or whoever you are. There's no forthcoming response. He knocks again. 
I, I know you're in there. I, I, I've got, again, I'm not coming in. I will leave you alone, but we are very badly hurt. And I, uh, if we don't find something, we're going to be very badly off. If you just want to like slip a note under the door or something, that's fine. I understand being wary of strangers, but please. Nothing. Catherine Deer is going to turn around. Are there any other houses nearby with lights on? Looking around, there doesn't appear to be. But as you scan the area, you hear the sound of small wooden wheels rolling across the damp cobbles. And as you look around, you trace the sound to a hunched figure bundled up in rags, pushing a rickety wooden cart through the fog. It seems to be moving away from you down the central avenue. Um, hello? Uh, excuse me, stop for a moment, please. And he's going to kind of attempt to non-threateningly jog up to the person. As you do, you see a face glance at you from over the shoulder. For a moment, you see uh, an older wrinkled face peering at you from below a cowl, and then quickly the cart turns into an alleyway out of sight. Do you follow? Uh... Yeah, no, I, this is the first person he's seen. He kind of wants to know what's going on. All right. You jog forward, doing your best to keep up the pace, even breaking into a brisk run at one point. As you do, you reach the cart just in time to see it beginning to turn a corner, perhaps 10 feet away from you in the dark, claustrophobic alley street. I... Hey, hello, I, excuse me, I, it's, it's okay if you don't, I, I'm not going to come any closer if you don't want me to, but I, my, my friends and I need help, and I, we'd be, I'd be willing to pay for help if that's an option. There's a pause and the figure slowly turns toward you. Looking, you see that this appears to be an older woman with aged and wrinkled face you can see that of her uh, the clothing that she is wearing appears to be an old yellowed shawl that falls over her shoulders a bit raggedy in places and a bit damp though she appears to be wearing over it a bit of a cloak that prevents the worst of the moisture from reaching her you can see that her whitish hair falls over her head and shoulders in great long uh, clumps and puffs of unkempt uh, hair and as she turns toward you her eyebrows furring you can see her tapping a fingernail on her cart yes deity what uh, can I do for you oh thank goodness I ma'am I, thank you so much I, I, my traveling companions and I ran into some trouble and we're from out of town, so we don't know much about this place. Uh, would you mind pointing us towards a, either an inn or a doctor or a priest? One of those. Or, you know, ideally both, if you can. But I, uh, we we kind of need somewhere to stay out of the... to recover. We're uh, all a bit bedraggled. You see her frown, her brow creasing. Oh, dearie, that's... that's... Uh, hmm... So you're not looking to get little something off the cart, then? Uh, I suppose. Oh, what? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, uh, I mean, actually, I would be terribly interested in that. That uh, sounds like a lovely idea. Oh, but of course, love. What, 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 what can, what can I get you? We, we got, we got dream pastries, a, a gold apiece. And she kind of lifts off the little uh, tarp covering at the top of the wooden car to reveal what looked to be a slightly steaming, uh, like, uh, pastries underneath. Uh, they actually, from here, smell fairly delicious. She offers you a small, albeit a somewhat reluctant, smile. They're, uh, they're made with the light and love of dreaming. I, uh, oh, that smells heavenly. I, uh, <sighs> All right. Uh, yeah. Tell you what. Get he fingers his nearly empty gold pouch. 
two of those, and if so, would you mind chatting about, say, where we could find that in while we, while, you know, I eat one? Well, I'm afraid that I don't, I don't linger around this village none too much, but, dearie, if you're looking for an inn, I think there might be a little old place in the center of town. I don't go there much, no. Just looking to peddle my wares. Oh, uh, splendid. Okay, that, thank you so much. That, that's what we really need to know. And, here, tell you what, get me a, yeah, get me three more of those. I'll, or, of course. Yeah, and he will gladden. I thank you so much. You don't know how long it's been since I've had a pot meal. Not a problem, dearie. That'll be five gold pieces for the five pastries. He will wince and dig in his pocket and produce them. Thank you. And, uh, can I get your name, ma'am? I, uh, I, I, you know, I always, one good turn deserves another, and I'd like to remember who helped me in a time of need. Of course. My name's Magantha. Oh, and a pleasure to doing business to you. She accepts the coins, not actually taking them, but kind of plucking them one by one out of your palm with long, slightly yellowed fingernails and tucking them away almost reverently in a little purse at her side. And with that, she reveals the tarp, offering you the pastries. Okay. I hope you enjoy. Yeah, thank you. And he is going to... In- are these meat pies or more of a pastry? They got a number of ingredients. A bit of meat pie in there. Got a, bit, a few other native ingredients. It's a secret family recipe. Ooh. I hope you enjoy. And if you're looking for more, I'm in town pretty often, so perhaps I'll be seeing you. I don't think we'll be sticking around, but I do appreciate that. And he will pick the five hottest looking pies and scoop them into his arms. Thank you, Miss Morgantha, and hope you have a good day. Of course, dearie. I hope you and your friends enjoy. We will. I'm sure I'll see you again. Yeah, I hope so. And he's going to trot back to the others with his ill-gotten gains. Well, I have two pieces of good news. I know where the inn is, and I have pie. But you said pie. pie. What? Yeah, no, there's a pie peddler. Like, just wheeling her cart around. Bring him over here, they fucking smell red. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did he you, will... Metreon, did you actually just say the word red? That... What's it to you? And yeah, it's no... just been so long since I heard anybody actually say that word. I... Really? Well, it's a good word. Uh, 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 red, just give me the goddamn pies. <laughs> Erythrin Deer will, like, lap into his sleeve and hand him one before giving one to Lillison and Amity. Here you go. And uh, Amity tries to was... stand up to accept the pie, uh, trying to, like, use her tail, like, pressing it against the ground for balance, not putting any weight on the, the broken foot. I, hey, hey, stay sitting. I can, I can come to you. And he's going to kneel down to hand it to her. Here, head. I, I really think you shouldn't be putting any weight on that till we get you a pair of crutches or something. It's it could be dangerous if it'll you know it might worsen the break. All right, Amity starts uh, stuffing her face into the pie. Mm. How long was that out for? Uh, oh, this is good. This is actually really good. Oh, yeah. yeah Metra is scarfing it down. Oh, fuck. yeah. This is. Oh, fuck. This is... Oh, I haven't had a good hot meal in ages. And he just uh, continues to... Well, I mean, no, no offense to you, Stu, love, but this is this is just next level. I was wondering, how, uh, how much should we pay you back? Uh, just gold apiece. They're a little expensive, but I imagine with, you know, her line of business, you kind of have to do that to get by. I mean, it sounds like these are worth it. And she's going to withdraw a gold coin and flip it through the air towards Erythrindir before um, starting in on hers. He attempts to catch it as best he can. 
Thank you. And he will do the same. I anybody have a spare fork? I uh forgot to bring cutlery. Just fucking eat it. I I, I don't wanna I don't wanna mess up my fingernails. I worked at <sighs> Fine. Here, you here kind of... no, uh, uh I have a mess kit in my bag. Oh, you're a lifesaver, and he will gladly accept that. Oh man. And he digs in. Are right. we like just sitting in the rain? I, I mean we've got the tarp. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Do we still have the bed sheet, or did you leave that? I left that. Okay. <sighs> All right, so uh, Amity and Metreon, I will need you two to make a constitution saving throw, please. Oh, no. Eight. Seventeen. All right. Metrogron, you finish the pie and feel this light, airy, warm feeling inside of you. That was delicious. Amity, you finish yours and you feel that same airy feeling, but it seems lighter even, as though you're being, you feel like you're being lifted up slowly. You're, the weight off your shoulder is being lifted. Even the pain in your foot, you can no longer feel. You feel your eyes slowly fluttering closed. And when you next open them, you're standing in a beautiful meadow golden daisies and flowers in all directions. You hear a soft snuffling from beside you, truffle oinking and rubbing against your leg as ahead a beautiful blue sky beams down upon you. It's warm. A soft breeze rustling through your hair and between your horns. And you feel the weight of a book at your side and you look down and you see to your happy astonishment a book of stories with a title you've never seen before in beautiful, ornate calligraphy. Oh, yeah. Amity uh, starts, um, you know, reading. Just just getting hooked. Um, it's, it's a very serene pastoral surroundings, I assume, with the, the meadow, the bright sun. It is. It's warm. It's beautiful. You feel you haven't this felt this much at peace in ages, even since before you came to Barovia. Even the name Barovia seems strange and distant to you, as though it's a place you've never seen before. There's too much peace here, too much warmth and joy. This is a place of serenity and welcome. You feel at home. Lillison, as you yes. take your fourth bite of pie and as Erthrandir begins cutting the first bite off of his. You see Metreon and Amity finish, Metreon wiping his lips with relish as Amity's eyes slide closed and she slumps onto the ground, I... unmoving. What the fuck? Oh, uh, she's having a we've, good one, yeah. We've been through a lot, all right. I, yeah, but she just toppled. Like, that. maybe she might be losing blood or something. Hold on. And he's going to try we'll and... check her leg, but I mean, I've seen this before. It's, I think she's just having a good ride, you know. I mean, we just we just saved our lives, you know, and yeah, you know, I think she's just finally at ease. She's got a hot meal in her. I think she's doing all right. Yeah, but she just kind of crumpled. Like, you know, normally there's a bit of time where you curl into the cozy armchair before you fall asleep. I. But you're probably right. He is going to check her over to see if she if he sees any evidence of, like, blood loss or anything, though. Looking over her, make a medicine check. Three! As far as you can tell, she seems to still be breathing. She doesn't seem to be in overall terrible condition. Overall, the tiredness that you feel in your body is somewhat repressive, but... You don't notice anything that seems to be immediately wrong with her. She just seems to be quietly non-responsive. All right. Qu question, Amity. Did you feed Anita Truffle? Um, I think that as I was saying, like, oh, this is really good, I was going to, like, offer Truffle a bite. I'm not sure whether I managed to, to get that to him before I fell unconscious. Uh, I would say that, you know, you might have offered him a bit of a crumb, but the... Pretty much the entirety of the pie was consumed by Amity. Quillison is going to look over to Metreon while she carefully sort of tries to prop herself up um, to a better sitting position. Uh, 
How do you feel? I mean, I feel ragged as fuck. Uh, just got some. He kind of exposes the gash on his collarbone. Uh, cut through some of these tattoos of mine. Gonna have to touch those up later. Uh, got to cut on my back too, but I mean, otherwise, you know, I got some. I'll be much better once we find that in. Uh, hopefully, they have a uh, a bottle of wine or three. Uh, but uh, otherwise, I'm I'm peachy. What about you? I mean, you know, uh, heaven. Uh, what happened down there? I I mean, as she takes another bite of pie and uh, waits while she chews and swallows before resuming, I fell and I blacked out for a moment and I suppose perhaps that thing might be I don't know like a a bear or something that loses interest in prey when they're not moving or something like that because when I came to again it was just a minute or so later and it was moving away and I went to catch up with the rest of you it had only been a few minutes it seemed Oh, playing dead. That's uh, smart of you. Yes, well, I wish I could say that it was a conscious choice of mine. Oh, just don't tell anyone it wasn't, and you know, make the best of it. She just smiles a little bit and uh, eats the rest of her pie. Yeah, Arthur Deer's doing the same now that he has procured fork. Oh, I, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. Like, Amity's a good cook, but oh my goodness. I, uh, right, it's the seasoning, it's the f- juicy meat. What's in, like, it, it, I gotta find out, I gotta find out what she put in there. She was all cagey, like she's got secret spices, which in my experience usually means about a pound of butter, but. I mean, a gold piece for a small little mincemeat pie, I mean, it's, it's. She's got to be having something in there that's great. Yeah, this golden yeah. flaky crust. Oh, I would. Oh. I'm gonna have to find her again. Yeah, no, that bit's the butter. Can't make decent crust without enough butter to drown a small chip. Well, that's a grim metaphor, but yeah, no, it. Man, Metron should... stares blankly at you. <laughs> you never mind. So, uh, how are you feeling? I know you've got a pretty nasty cut, and also the. That plate basement wasn't exactly kind to you. I just want to get, I just want to get out of here. How's yeah. uh, how's Blue Girl over there doing? He looks her over at Kiva. She's breathing. I uh, don't know much else. I uh, I hope she's okay. Even after the shit she pulled, I want her to be all right. It's heavy stuff, then. Yeah. No, I. I, uh, I, I did not expect her to, I mean, I guess it makes a bit of sense with how she'd been acting, but still, her whole family, poor thing, that's a lot to have to foist onto a bunch of strangers. Should we try to wake her? Should we leave her be? I think she needs it, and I think we need it too, or speaking of which, is... Are you are you feeling better now that that ghost's out of you? I know it was kind of that can have been fun. Oh yeah, no, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling uh, feeling real good. Yeah, uh, great. thank goodness <laughs> you were uh, you were acting real weird. It was a uh, not a fun time, but glad to hear you're better. Should Just with we, you, man. Um, should we perhaps go find that inn and put in a word for a, a few rooms? That's a good idea. I'd rather be in a bed, shagged up with a bottle of wine, and yeah, you know, not wet. That At this does point, Lilith, like I will need you to make yeah. a Constitution saving throw, please, as you take the last. My, bite of pie. my favorite. That's a seven. Erthrandir and Metreon, as soon as those words escape Lilith's lips, you watch her eyes suddenly flutter closed, and she slumps to the ground. I... Oi. You good there? It's like Amity. She's just out. 
Yeah. I mean, she's been knocked around a few times. Yeah, but uh, maybe. Hold it. I'm trying to remember. Did did she inhale the mist, or was that? Did she stay inside? I really can't remember. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, she was out there with you and Emily when you tried when you three tried to leave. Well, I guess if I pass out, then we know that that stuff really takes it out of you. But, geez, I hope she's all right. Maybe it's an allergic reaction or something. Or no, no not this. Uh, like I said, I've seen these these expressions on people before. Uh, usually, it's after imbibing certain uh, uh, certain herbal remedies. Maybe it's <laughs> uh, uh, an herb that's in the pie. Maybe that's why it's one gold. I mean, <laughs> oh, what you think the old granny is running the drug trade? <laughs> Listen, I'm not mad at it. I don't knock a hustle. Yeah, no, I in a place like this, it might be one of your only ways to get by, but <laughs> I, uh, he kind of looks down at his pie, shrugs, and finishes the rest. Well, honestly, I could use that right now if that is the case. Yeah, Thrinder, give me a constitution saving throw, please. Thirteen. All right. With that... You find yourself slowly growing more tired, your eyes growing heavy. At Metreon, you watch as Erthrandir as well, as his eyes suddenly flutter closed and slumps against the wall behind him, the empty pie tin clattering to the ground as his arms go limp. Well, shit. Uh, Metreon just sort of looks around. Uh, and sees the empty python in his hand and just kind of chucks it behind him. <sighs> well, I guess I'll let you all rest. Um, how is uh, Kiva doing? Kiva appears to be breathing steadily, her chest rising and falling. She might wake up soon. Seeing that everyone's just kind of conked out, uh, Metreon is actually going to start to put on his disguise, his makeup. Uh, and... He's going to put himself together, try to cover up the wound, uh, wipe off the blood that's on the coat at least. Uh, and he's going to go ahead. He'll actually, he'll drag all, all of them to kind of cluster them together. And uh, is the tarp something I could take down? Uh, Erthrandir? Uh, yeah, no, it's literally just a plastic sheet. Or not plastic, but cloth. You can pretty easily just pull it back and fold it. Okay. Yeah, uh, he'll take the, uh, I guess it'd be like leather or something, right? Or, but like whatever kind of tarp it is, he'll uh, unfasten it uh, and he'll cover them in it just so that they don't get too wet uh, while he goes and he's going to actually look for this inn. All right. As you do, leaving them behind, Lillison, you feel yourself sinking into a warm, comfortable darkness for the space around you is brightened by a warm amber light. You are find yourself seated in a comfortable, well-crafted chair of plush pillows and backing, well-carved mahogany, sitting at a large dining table, itself inset with elegant displays of gilded leaves and designs of trees and cornucopias of fruits and vegetables. Around you, illuminated by the light of the many flickering candles and candelabras that lend a warm, cheery glow to the atmosphere of the room, you see several other people, some a bit older than you, a few others of similar age, a few of younger. Each of them dressed in bright, fine clothing. You hear the muffled buzz of polite, friendly conversation. There's a thick, sweet smell, delightful, wafting off of a thick pitcher of wine at the center of the table, and a beautiful outlay of food, comforting and warm and delicious before you, your own plate loaded high. There's laughter and warm, friendly conversation, and as you look around it all, there's a hand on your shoulder, and looking up, you see an older man, his hair graying at the temples, smiling down at you, giving your shoulder a squeeze and then turning back to his own plate as the conversation and the laughter resumes.
Willison, in her dream, uh, smiles very wide, lowers her head so that nobody can see her blushing, and picks up her fork. Erthrin, dear. Feel that same slow, warm sinking, the darkness coming up around you, but it's not an alien darkness. It's not terrifying. It's welcoming, like an old friend. You feel a coolness against your sides, and you realize that you're in water, but not the cold, dank water of the manner you were just in, but warm. And as a wave crashes against you, you taste salt on your tongue, your hair falling down in wet, straggled locks over your shoulders. As you sputter, pulling the water out of your eyes, you look out and you hear a cheer from your other direction. You can see a number of figures, familiar silhouettes, pointed ears and assorted chests bare as a number of friendly individuals gather upon the shore, waving at you and cheering, a few of them wading into small pools that form along the sand and rocks of the shore. You offer a wave and you feel another wave gentle cr crash against the back of your head, leaving you chuckling and sputtering once more. You can see brightly colored fish wafting through the water as pleasantly green seaweed slowly wafts from the, from the ocean floor below you. Behind the figures on shore, you can see a number of docks of warm chestnut oak jutting out into the water. Beyond the docks, you can see clusters of people in bright colors, greens and reds and yellows, gathering, speaking, doing business, gathering and celebrating, and behind them, silhouetted against great, majestic walls of wood and stone, a beautiful, homely city that rises over the backdrop of a deep, evergreen, viridian forest beyond. Small wafts of smoke gently rising from the towers, and the soft and gentle welcoming roar of the ocean mixing with the distant sound of life. He is going to wave back at his friends on the shore, and then, kind, and then, giving them a smile, he is going to turn back and, as best, and dive down as deep as he can, just enjoying the water running through his hair, and eventually scanning the ocean floor for shells and sand dollars as he sinks into the sea. It's, it's warm and beautiful and comfortable, and behind you the small, cozy city rises up over the waves of the shore wooden stone buildings rising up against the backdrop of the forest and slowly you feel yourself losing your conscious thoughts to the gentle waves as they crash upon the shore Metreon yes I believe you were making your way toward the aforementioned tavern uh, or at least trying to find it yeah of course with that you leave the rest of the members of your party behind, clutching your makeshift cloak to your shoulders to avoid the worst of the damp, slowly trudging through the dark cobblestone street. You give a few wary glances at a few hunched over buildings that look ready to and are hopeful to vanish in the mire. A few of them cracked and decrepit, others boarded up with faint flickers of light beyond their boarded up or closed tight shutters. And as you make your way forward, you can see the street opening up into a larger central square. You can see that here a single shaft of light thrusts illumination into this main square, its brightness looking like a solid pillar in the heavy fog. You can see above the gaping doorway of a building to your right, a sign hangs precariously askew, proclaiming this structure to be the Blood on the Vine Tavern. Yeah, uh, he pulls over his hood so that the 
you know, the, any kind of moisture uh, isn't like affecting the shoe polish that's in his hair. Um, he's wrapped his tail around his, his uh, waist so it looks more like a belt. Um, he's painted his face and hands in the, uh, the light tan pancake makeup that he carries with him. Uh, but he will very hesitantly go on in. Does it smell like anything? Are there any sounds that he hears that kind of like he recognizes as being a tavern and not, you know, another death house? Making your way inside, you were immediately hit by the stench, not of death, but of old, but comfortably sharp alcohol. Uh, he, uh, it, it, he, his eyes flutter a bit as he, as he feels that, or as he senses that. As you make your way forward, you pass into a dark, dingy tap room. The tables are worn, the varnish scuffed and scratched. There's a blazing fire roaring in a hearth to your right-hand side that casts long shadows across the worn tables that dot the room, their own varnish scuffed and scratched. The bricks of the fireplace you can see are smeared with decades of gray-white ash, and the flames do little to warm the sluggish chill that pervades the Barovian air. You can see an old wooden bar, dinged and stained with age that runs the length of the western wall, its surface piled high with chipped glasses, Behind the counter, you can see standing a pudgy little man, his face pale and his gaze pointed straight ahead. He doesn't so much as glance toward you, his attention focused on the musty glass he's polishing. You can see a few other souls crowded around the tables close to the bar, wearing drab and worn clothing. They drink their wine and speak in low, hollow tones, a few glancing toward you, but soon returning to their own business without much obvious interest. You can see three women wearing colorful dresses and several pieces of decorative jewelry, each glancing toward you from a table near the front door, then return their attention to their game of cards. After a moment, you hear the sound of quiet laughter, which soon quiets to hushed, unrushed conversation. The final occupant of the bar, a young man with shoulder length, golden brown hair and a chiseled jaw, sits alone at a corner table sipping from a glass of wine. As you enter, his eyes drift toward you and linger there, watching you with some interest. Um, I know you had mentioned the women who were kind of uh, decoratively dressed. Um, who in this tavern seems to look, if any, if any one of them do, uh, like they might have uh, either some money on them or maybe come from money? Looking over them, the three, you know, brightly dressed women, uh, you notice that, you know, they seem to be wearing small bits, uh, in some cases, of homely jewelry. Um, I just meant all the brighter. patrons, like, just doing, like, a cursory glance. At, oh, at make, a, uh, make a perception check. Uh, a nine. Looking around, it, the room seems to be fairly quiet. Most of the other occupants wearing drab, homely clothing. It doesn't appear to be much of great value scattered among the crowd here. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll take notice of the, the handsome man uh, checking me out. Uh, I'll throw him a bit of a, a corner smirk, uh, but uh, I'll tap the bar. Uh, excuse me. Uh, barkeep? As you make your way to the bar, you tap on its surface, and what you see behind it hanging an old painting of a green vine bearing thin, shriveled grapes painted to look like they're bleeding red droplets into a half-full wine glass. The painting itself is covered with cracks and a large slash across the lower left side has caused the canvas to sag and curl, the edges yellowing with obvious age. The barkeep himself stands beside a large pile of dingy-looking glasses, one of the hands that he's currently polishing, softly rustling against the cloth that he holds against it. He blinks, staring straight forward, and his gaze slowly almost trudges toward you. What do you want? Uh, well, yes. Uh, uh, I'm actually interested uh, in two things. Uh, first, I see that you are a uh, purveyor of alcohol. Uh, I would like some. Uh, uh, preferably red, if you have it. Uh, also, um, I see that that's... Um, is, is this a is this a in, in as well as a tavern? Glass of wine costs one copper. 
pitcher costs one silver. What do you want? Uh, do you happen to have bottles? Bottle service at all? Pitcher costs one silver. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, uh, I'll take uh, uh, I'll take a pitcher. However, um, any rooms available? Uh, or is there perhaps a more hospitable inn in town? He blinks at you. And then, as he does, you hear footsteps from behind you. You feel a hand on your shoulder. Excuse me, Fred. I could not help but overhear. Forgive me for intruding. You turn and you see the uh, uh, brown-haired man who you had seen uh, glance at you as you entered. He is tall and well-built, a sharp jaw to his figure, and you can see strapped to his side a long sword sheath in a scabbard that appears to be fairly well kept and polished. He offers you a nod of greeting. I uh, do not mean to uh, overstep, but uh, you seem to be new in town. Please, allow me to pay for your wine. Uh, well, uh, it's quite a long sword you've got there. Uh, sure, of course, yes. Uh, I would love uh, to have some wine. Uh, do you, uh, Maybe you're a, a more articulate person to speak with. Uh, do you happen to know of any lodging uh, accommodations in this charming little town of yours? The man shrugs his shoulders and shakes his head. I'm afraid that there is not as present. Uh, you will have to forgive poor Eric. He is uh, not the most talkative sort. The blood on the vine, I am afraid, does not have uh, rooms as such. Um, you might be able to find some uh, hospitality amongst the townsfolk, but if you would like, uh, I would be more than glad to uh, discuss, potentially. Uh, uh, you seem, again, you seem to be new. I would be more than glad to uh, give you a lay of the land as it, as it would be so. I would love a handsome tour guide. Uh, what was your name again? Oh, forgive me. My poor manners. My name is Ismark. Ismark, Ismark Olyanovich. What is Metrion's passive perception? Uh, his passive perception is only an 11. All right. From the table bes beside you, a few feet away, you hear a, a low grunt and a man's voice murmur. Ismark the lesser. Huh. Ismark sighs and affixes his gaze on you. A small, humorless smile on his face. Don't worry, love. I'm sure you're just as adequate as everybody else here. Uh, yes. Um, well, I actually have uh, companions that I've been traveling with. And uh, we would love uh, a place to rest our heads for the evening. Uh, you know, it's dreadfully wet outside. It's uh, much warmer in here, though. But forgive me, you keep on referring to we. Uh, are there others that uh, you have come with? <laughs> yes, yes, I, I'm, I'm with the party. We were traveling through the woods uh, in, in search of uh, a general store here in town. In, in fact, if you happen to have one, I'd love to be pointed in that direction. Yes, I believe you would be looking for a Gildras Mercantile. Gildras uh, Mercantile, uh, fair point. Uh, and where would that be? <laughs> That is uh, just across the square, though. For now, I doubt they are open, given that given the uh, darkness of the hour. But if you, it is quite easy to find, I am glad to point it to you. Uh, if you do not mind my asking, where are your compatriots? Uh, they're resting right now. It was, the journey was quite long. Uh, perhaps, though, I'll take that wine. Ah, but of course, and. Uh, Eric returns, setting the pitcher on the counter, and Ismark drops a uh, single silver piece there. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate you your and uh, your business. Eric just nods hollowly and returns to polishing the glass, staring vacantly ahead. Shall we perhaps take a seat? Ismark nods. But of course, uh, if you would not like to uh, fetch your friends, then that is not the problem. Uh, I'm more than glad to uh, do what I can to help accommodate you all when they are uh, fully rested. Please, uh, sure. my own thing. I'm sure they'll be fine. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be fine. Yes, let's. <laughs> he sets down and returns to his own glass of wine, taking a brief sip. So, uh, as I mentioned, you seem to be a newcomer to uh, the village. 
Uh, and actually, here, let me, and he pours you a drink from the pitcher. You will have to uh, excuse the poor vintage. It is, uh, I'm afraid that Barovia is too far beneath the castle's shadow to receive uh, frequent shipments of uh, better make. I'm, I'm sure it's adequate. I, I've been without for some days now, and uh, I just want to, a taste, if anything. Uh, and he'll uh, he'll take a sip. It is reasonably good wine. There's a bit of a grape. Uh, the grape flavor is a little more pronounced. It's a nice purplish uh, vintage, and it goes down relatively easily. It's not delicious, but it's perfectly serviceable. But it does its job, doesn't it? It will, it will suffice for uh, most of my uh, neighbor's needs. Tell me about your charming little town. I, we saw a, a rather uh, interesting house on the way in. Uh, I, it didn't seem to be occupied, though. Uh, there were perhaps uh, some children playing in the yard, but uh, very strange looking. Do you know anything about it? You will have to be more specific. I don't know of many homes with uh, children playing a three outside. Story, uh, a three-story house, uh, kind of a, maybe like a, a old purplish mauve siding, uh, dark slatted wood. Uh, two children, uh, uh, older, uh, uh, an older girl and a, a younger sibling boy, I, uh, perhaps. Uh, didn't seem to be occupied. Is Mark's face pales a bit. That, oh. Uh, most uh, Barovians tend to avoid that particular uh, structure. I see, I see. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do make sure to let up my uh, companions know to avoid it if possible. Uh, so, uh, you said that the general store it, it would not be open at this hour. Um, what would we do for the night? Well, there is... I am something of a purveyor of uh, law in this village, and I have a certain number of guest rooms at my family's house that I may be willing to provide, but uh, unfortunately, there is a bit of a dilemma that my family is facing, and I would prefer to perhaps first speak with the uh, well, suffice it to say that uh, I am looking for assistance with a matter that is of some concern to me, and it somewhat concerns any uh, guest domiciles that I might be willing to offer. Uh, Metreon gently places his hand on top of this, Marks. Uh, of course. We would, uh, I'm sure my companions, once they are uh, rested, would be willing to assist uh, in exchange for lodging, of course. Uh, where is your family estate? Is it? Did you say? Uh, how, how large was the house? It is uh, my father's uh, manor. It is uh, not far from here, on the south end of town. A manor? Uh, and he kind of puts that at your hand and like offers you a small... Like, like a small bit of, like a confused grin, it just kind of, you know, lifts his hand beneath yours and pats the back of your palm before returning to his wine. Regardless, um, I think that uh, I would, if you think that your uh, compatriots would be amenable to helping, it is uh, a simple matter of uh, a concern facing a family member of mine. We were hoping for assistance uh, relocating her to... Uh, a nearby village. Do you think they would be willing to assist with that? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, I've, uh, I, I can only assume, but I, I do believe uh, that the rest of the party, uh, my companions, yes, we would love to get out of Barovia as soon as possible. Uh, so if it means uh, escorting this uh, family member of yours, then uh, I'm sure it can be negotiated. But, uh, all right then, that sounds uh, very heartening. Thank you. I am glad to uh, hear of it. Um, in the meantime, um, well, I hope that the wine has, uh, done some to, uh, steal your spirits. I know that, uh, for newcomers, the, uh, 
their entry into our country can come as a bit of a shock. Oh, of course. And by this point, he's actually, uh, has actually taken the picture himself and has poured up himself a second glass. Yes, no, the, uh, the accommodations were quite jarring. Uh, I come from, uh, uh, a much more urban setting, uh, a metropolis, if you will. Uh, Waterdeep, have you heard of it? Deep grounds. I'm afraid that I have not. Uh, I've no knowledge of uh, any Waterdeep. But uh, then again, Barovia's history has made it a bit of a, a fairly isolated place. There is not really much news of other nations that comes through our borders. How tragic. Well... I'll tell you all about it. Uh, and at this point, uh, uh, Metreon will start to maybe regale him with a, uh, a bit of very vague but still colorful uh, kind of overview of what Waterdeep is, uh, how sprawling it is, how massive it is. All right. Ismark listens with some vague interest. And it's at this point, Kiva, that your eyes snap open and you inhale slowly and you see a slow drizzle falling from the sky above, a black night sky overcast with cloud and fog covering the space above you. So Kiva is going to take some time to just sort of get her bearings. Um, does she see the rest of the group sort of around her or is she sort of alone in this scenario? You see around you, uh, Erthrandir, Lillison, and Amity all evidently sleeping or unconscious or otherwise unmoving on the sides of the wall beside you. Metreon is nowhere in sight. And does she have the sort of wherewithal to understand that she's not in Death House anymore? <laughs> like she's outside. Oh yes, you and, okay. look around and you can see the the darkened streets, the drizzle slowly falling. You can see the dark houses around you, and uh, through the faint illumination of moonlight overhead, you can see the dark silhouette of the castle above. And in the distance, you can hear the echoing sobs that resound through the street. So the first thing she's going to do is just sort of stand up and walk out into the street, into the rain, and just let it sort of wash over her. And she's going to wipe her face and wipe the blood off of her body and just sort of um, try to take a moment to cleanse herself as best as possible. Um, and then she's going to go over and make sure that uh, Amity, Erthrinder, and Lillison seem to be like as stable as possible just because they're breathing. She's still worried that they might be sort of injured. And then um, make a medicine check. That would be so exciting. Okay. That is a 17. All right. Looking over them, they don't appear to be overly injured, though. Something about Amity's foot and a large bruise on Lillison's uh, stomach gives you some reason for concern. Amity, in particular, seems like the foot is uh, heavily damaged. But looking over them, they seem. Strangely peaceful in their sleep, though it seems strangely light. And as you look over them, you realize that they don't seem to be sleeping as you've known non-elves to do. They seem to be almost trancing. A light fluttering of their eyelids, their breathing too light and shallow to be a sufficient deep sleep. It's strange. You've not seen younger lived races expressing this kind of behavior before. Um, after sort of checking all of them, she's going to take a moment and realize that Lillison is with them, and that's going to sort of freak her out a little bit. She is going to try to, she's going to touch Lillison and sort of push the hair out of her face and try to see if she'll wake up. She doesn't wake up at that immediate touch, but as you feel her skin, it's cold and somewhat clammy. Though from how much of that is her skin itself and the drizzle and mist that is spilled over her, you cannot quite say. Do you try to shake her awake or just seeing if that gentle touch pushes her? She's going to gently try to shake her awake if possible. All right. With that, Lillison, the space around you, the you feel the warm and welcoming air of the 
dining room that you're sitting in, the comfortable and friendly conversation, the sound of laughter. And then those senses slowly fade. You reach and grasp for, that for them. You feel the table growing more distant as your chair is pulled away from it into darkness. The cheery, happy scene slowly pulling away from you as the happy conversation and the joyous meal continues, but without you. You slowly begin to fall and fall as the darkness swallows you up and your eyes open and you see Kiva staring down at you. No, no, don't, don't leave. Don't, don't. Ow. I love, uh, who are you talking to? Uh, I, uh, I was, uh, having a dream. I apologize. No, uh, don't apologize. I, I'm so glad to see you. I, I really thought you were gone. I, um, uh, no, I just lagged behind a little bit. I am sorry. No, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't come back for you. I, I thought you were behind me and then, um, it was too late. So I just, I'm very, very glad that you're okay. And then Kiva's going to put some distance in between the two of them, realizing that she probably still has her hand on the listen. Um, how are you feeling now? Um, a bit fucking knackered, if I can be honest, but, um, otherwise fine, I suppose. How are you? I, uh, it hurts to breathe. I, um, I suppose I fell asleep for a bit. Um, uh, last I remembered, uh, oh, yes, uh, Erthrinder found, um, a pastry cart and brought back some hot food for all of us, and he also found out that there was, uh, a ta uh, an inn or a tavern somewhere nearby, and I think somebody was going to go and, and see if there were rooms. Um, are you hungry? Uh, no, I, I, I'm not that hungry right now. Actually, I'm. I sort of feel sick still after everything that happened. If that makes sense. All right. Um. Also, uh, Amity's foot. There's something wrong with it. Um. When. Uh. Where's? Oh, I suppose Metreon must have gone. Well, should we? I mean, maybe I should go after Matrion and see if I can find him if you want to stay here with the others, or I can I can stay here with you. I... Well... Come to think of it, perhaps Matrion is not the best person to send to a tavern. So, um, if you would go find him, I think that would be good. Absolutely, um... Can I bring you anything while I'm there? Uh, no, I think that if, if there are rooms there, that was our hope, I think, um, then we should perhaps get some and then find some way to bring Amity there. We might need to have somebody carry her or, oh, um, how, how much do you have in your purse right now? I, uh, I wasn't in charge of carrying the coins in my family, so I have, uh, nothing at this point. Oh, um, here. And... Oh, no, no, I, um, you, you really don't have to. I... Oh, but if, if we're going to get rooms, I think, I mean, we can all divide up the money, the cost afterwards. Uh, and she extends, uh, five gold. I'll, uh... I'll go see about getting us rooms. Uh, thank you. All right, so at this point, Kiva is going to go off and look for the tavern and Metreon. All right. You make your way through the dark, misted streets, 
passing behind, beside the dark alleyways and slowly making your way toward the central square. And there you see the lone shaft of light plunging from the dark Blood on the Vine Tavern to your right-hand side. Uh, without hesitation, she's going to just go inside. All right, you enter into the door and pass inside, seeing the dark and dreary tavern within a few of the patrons turning to face you, as you do. Your steps echo off of the old creaking wooden floor of the place. You can hear the clinking of glasses. Glancing around, it takes you but a moment as you notice the number of occupants of the pudgy barkeep, the woman in colorful dresses. In the corner of the room, you can see Metreon, his arms wide, a bit of color to his face uh, as he seems to be regaling a young man with shoulder blank brown hair and sitting alone beside him. The two of them appear to be uh, sh having w glasses of wine, though you can see that Metreon, as he, as he does, is pouring himself another glass and happily downing a good amount of it. And you can hear Metreon's voice slightly raised in his gesticulating arms from this d distance. And so I says to, you know, if you don't want to be a sheep, then don't go to the trades wards. But, Kiva's you know, that's, a, that's enough <laughs> about me. Uh, this, oh, Kiva. Uh, and I would say that uh, Metreon would see her since he's position he, he knows to never put his back towards the door. Um, so I would say that he, he would probably see her uh, come in. You look much better than I feel, and Kiva's going to walk over to the two of them. Ismark, Ismark. This young uh, woman here, this lovely young thing, this is Kiva. It's Mark inclines his head. It is a pleasure to meet you, uh, Mr. Lady Kiva. Uh, welcome to uh, the humble village of Brovia. I am told by uh, your friend Metrion that you have only uh, recently arrived. You could say that I'm a recent transplant, yes, but uh, Lady Kiva feels far too polite for someone of my stature. She's being modest. Yeah. Love, come sit, sit, have a glass, yes. Okay, um, do you know, um, Ismark, is it? If, uh, if I can get rooms here, I was sort of sent by uh, one of the others to make sure that I acquired them. And since I'm carrying someone else's gold, I feel that it's important that I figure this out. I had actually uh, discussed this with your friend uh, Metrion before. Unfortunately, the Blood on the Vine does not have uh, rooms as such, but... Uh, we had uh, discussed a potential arrangement between the two of us. Uh, he said that uh, you and your friends might be interested in uh, helping with a bit of a problem that I'm facing. Uh, I'd be more than glad to see if I could put you up in the uh, guest rooms of uh, my family's manor. It would not be a problem. Kiva looks carefully at Metreon and then sort of sits down at the table and says, that seems reasonable if I can ask you for some help as well. I would be glad to consider it. What uh, What is the manner of assistance you are looking for? Well, um, I'm wondering if I can get an audience with the Burgomaster. I found a letter from him, and I would very much like to speak to him about um, a way out of Barovia. You see his marks face darken and his eyes downcast. I'm afraid that uh, you've come a bit late. My father passed away some recent days ago. Your father? I'm I'm so sorry. I had no I idea. My condolences, love. It is all right. It is something my sister and I are still uh, we are still working through it. Um, but it is it is a family matter. But I'm curious. How did you come to know of my father? We do not, well, uh, given the nature of our country, we do not often. Uh, have outsiders knowing of me or my family? When we arrived in Barovia, um, it seems that your father hired a letter carrier to try to get some word out, and um, well, we found the letter carrier, and I found the letter. Um, he said, I'm assuming uh, Irina is your sister, um, that she seems to be in danger with um, 
quite a nasty uh, creature and um, told us to leave and never come back if possible but it was too late we were already inside and now we're trapped here so um, I'm supposing if that letter was supposed to reach the outside world that once we're in we're rather stuck here is that an incorrect assumption? As Mark winces visibly, judging by your your tone and the context, uh, I would presume that by the way that you said that you found the messenger, that you did not in fact uh, engage Master Oldensky in conversation. Uh, no, he was um, quite unable to converse at the time. Unfortunate. My father and I had feared as much. You are correct. It, it was my father's wish that such a missive be delivered to the beyond the walls of mist, but evidently it was a fool's errand. I am sorry that you had to come upon him as such. It was unbefitting. Ismark, be a love and uh, fetch us another pitcher, yes? He blinks and then... My goodness, I did not expect you to empty that pitcher so quickly. Uh, it is not a problem. I will, I will return in a moment. Thank you, Please, thank you. Uh, Miss Kiva, if you prefer such a term, uh, do feel free to make yourself comfortable. As he exits, leaving the two of you alone. Uh, Mitrion leans in very quickly. Wait, it's, it's, it's our brother. Holy fuck. We, we're not getting, we're not getting involved in that. Is this what he was asking me about? We're supposed to help this girl. Well, yes, but now that I know it's fucking her, I don't want to do that. Look, maybe we don't have to do anything if we just get a place to stay and sneak out. I mean, I used to do this, and I'm sure you're adept at, I don't know, hiding in places and then getting out when the sun comes up. So I think we should just try to cut our losses, and she's making sure Ismark isn't looking, and maybe stay the night and, you know, pretend we're offering help to this girl. But really, I mean, what can we do against a vampire anyway? We just try to run in the morning. All right, yeah, sounds good. We'll we'll shack up with him. Maybe you know, if there's any silverware, we'll take that. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll leave before dawn. Look, I hate to be a bastard, but if he's the son of the burgomaster, there's got to be something worth selling. So, I think it might be a good idea to take a look around when we're there. Uh, Metreon nods in agreement, but then sees uh, Ismark. Looks like maybe he's wrapping up the purchase of the second pitcher and uh, adjusts himself accordingly. And Kiva also just tries to like play it cool and, um, you know, adjust her hair and just pretends like she was just, you know, sort of chatting up Metreon and then waits for him to come back. With that, as Mark returns with the wine and a grin on his face, and Lillison. Yes. You find yourself sitting quite alone in the quiet drizzle of the Barovian streets. What are you doing? She sits alone for quite a while, sort of drawing her legs up against her chest and hugging her legs close. Then she starts rubbing her hands together, trying to get them warm. And after about 10 minutes, she looks around furtively, then moves just a couple of fingers, just trying to figure out like the smallest motions she can possibly make to summon her mage hand. The skeletal hand appears hanging in the air. She is gonna look at it, frown, and then direct it towards Erthrindir and have it kind of wiggle his shoulder a little bit. He doesn't immediately seem to respond. She frowns a bit and then wiggles a little harder. All right. Erthrandir, you feel the warm water of the surf push up against you. You hear your friends cheering as the smoke rises from the city in the distance. And then you feel something grasping around your shoulder and beginning to pull you away. You reach out your hand and a wave crashes over your head and you feel something pulling you deeper underneath the surf. But it's not water. You're not drowning, but it's just darkness coming up around you. And then you feel the light pitter-patter of moisture on your face, and you open your eyes, and you see Lillison staring at you mournfully from a few yards away. 
as your eyes open once more and acclimate to the dreary chill of the Barovian street. Who are you? I would like to know that myself. I, wait, hold hold on. Where I was... No, I was just home. I... I, it, I know. He sits bolt upright. What the... What? I... Hey, Lillison? Yes. What... What just... I... Lillison. Elves don't have dreams. She just looks at him. He kind of pants a bit, and then you see him kind of flick the flick a tear away from his eye and then turn to her. That was weird. I, uh, you know, usually when I trance, I get memories. I don't get stuff that never happened. Okay, well, I guess it's it, it's over now. It's fine. Everything's fine. Uh, how are you doing? Well, uh, I think that saying everything's fine is a bit premature. Right. Um, look, um, I suppose Metreon went to the inn or the tavern, and um, I just asked Kiva to go after him and, and maybe get us some rooms, and I am so glad that it, you seem wakeable, so... And she's going to send her mage hand over to Amity and wiggle Amity's shoulder. Amity, you continue reading through the pages, the warm light around you, truffle unking happily. You feel at peace, a warm summer sun overhead, the breeze caressing your hair as you turn e eagerly to the book, you're reaching the end of the first story and you're just about to find how it ends. And you feel something cold grasping your shoulder, something bony. And with that, you feel yourself being pulled away, the book spilling from your grasp as you topple backwards and awaken your, ch <laughs> your back slumped against the cold wooden wall of the house behind you. Amity's face goes from a contentful bliss look to just heavy and tired. Ugh. How long was I out for? Oh, God. Ugh. It's you. Yeah. How you feeling? Amity goes to lick the pie tin. Oh, dang it. Truffle's already done that, probably. Um. <laughs> oh, yeah, he has. There's a little smear of... Uh of pie crumbs at the corner of his snout. Oh my god. Well, I was doing pretty good. Yeah, same. But yeah. I think we gotta get going. We don't want any of us to catch cold after what we've been through. How long have I been out for? What what time is it? Mm -mm. I... I don't know. Wow. I was... Um... I was... When did Metreon leave? Like it, he, I don't, I don't know. I just kind of, I just kind of conked. I guess he must have gone while we were out. Real considerate that, you know, somebody could have come along and robbed us blind. Well, right, he doesn't have any real obligation to us. I gotta respect that. But we should go find them. They probably it's, found a place mm, to stay. It's been about mm, ten minutes since I sent Kiva after him, so... Alright. Well, let's do it. And he kind of... Do you think if we we help you, Amity, do you think you could stand, like, moving on one foot? Um... Hold on. Uh, Amity tries to support herself um, with her good leg and her tail 
Um, though she'll accept, she'll like reach out an arm uh, and accept someone helping her up. Yeah, Aerith and Deer will sling an arm over her shoulder and kind of help support her weight as she pulls her upright. Yeah, there you go, there you go. I gotcha. Lillison kind of hovers, but doesn't actually touch her. Sorry, Truffle, you'll have to walk. Um, I, so we're, we're, we're getting food here. And then we're going then, home. Then we're going. Yep. We'll, I, it's getting late. We'll head back tomorrow morning. I, so we have to stay another night here. I don't want to travel at night here. I, uh, I don't trust this place. I mean, I don't trust sleeping here either, but at least that I can keep a loaded longbow pointed at the door if I get particularly antsy. Amity smiles sadly. I've been awake for most of the last 40 hours, so if we have to sleep, then that's fine. Yeah, come on. Let's go see how Kiva and Matreon are doing. If he's managed to lose himself at the bottom of a bottle yet. And with that, he's going to kind of help start moving the two of them towards Blood on the Vine. Uh, I was having the best dream back there, and I'm actually really tired, so we could just get to our room. I gotcha. Mm, yeah. Ow. Is it... Ethan, do you... Do you know... If we can, like, patch this thing up, you have you have healing magic. Tomorrow. I need sleep before I can pull anything like that, but... Maybe? I'm gonna be honest, my healing spell is, uh... Something I just remembered after, like, learning it once 50 years ago and then promptly forgetting it, so... I don't actually know how much it does. <laughs> Willing to try, though. At minimum, it'll patch up the cuts and bruises. All right, good, because I really don't want to put any weight on this right now. Yeah, here, come on. And he'll kind of take more of her weight. I gotcha. Let's go. As she walks, Amity sort of realizes something. Maybe, maybe once they get in the tavern so that everyone is there to talk. All right. I I was, are you saying this before or after you get to the tavern, just to clarify? Let's say after, just so that everyone's there for it. All right, so let's, as you make your way down the street together, Amity slowly hobbling her way and leaning on Erthrandir for support as best she can, and Lillison following behind as Truffle pursues, waddling through the muck and oinking occasionally in concern. You find your way to the central square of town, following a number of recent muddy boot prints that turn their way toward an old, large building that appears to be labeled with the name Blood on the Vine Tavern. Together you proceed inward through the door, passing into the dark and dingy tap room beyond. You notice the worn tables, the blazing fire that exudes a pathetically small amount of heat. The old wooden bar behind which the barkeep mindlessly polishes the glasses one by one. You can see the other souls crowded around the tables, a few having left Kiva and Metria notice since you had arrived, but those that remain who wear drab and worn clothing, speaking in low, hollow tones, suddenly glance toward the entrance. But as Amity follows on Erthrandir's shoulder, you can see several glance away in obvious fear, while others whisper and point at the motley members of your party. The three colorful women eye you for a moment with vague disinterest and then return to their game of cards. And as you enter, the three of you also see Metrion and Kiva seated at a table uh, beside a tall young man with dirty blonde hair, a long sword strapped to his side, and a dark vest over a round tunic. He glances up as the two of them seated notice you as well. We well, you know there's a bronze dragon, apparently, but I I, I haven't seen it, so I don't... Uh, oh! Uh, uh, Randy! Uh, uh, Amity, Lillison, this, this is the rest of our party. Come, come, sit, please. All right. He's going to kind of 
gingerly move over there as quickly as he can. Ah, <sighs> well, we we didn't we did manage to wake up. Thanks for leaving us back there, by the way. I really enjoyed the taste of mud. I left a tarp on you. I, that doesn't work fully. You gotta, like, put something on the edges just to other, stop the rainwater from coming in. Else it's just kind of a... Pish posh. Uh, barkeep, three more glasses, yes. Did we take the tarp with us? Mm, Erythrindir did. He is okay. keeping that tarp. Metron, you watch as the barkeep just mindlessly turns and begins pouring out three more glasses and then just leaves them on the counter, staring expectantly forward. Yeah. As Mark coughs and murmurs, excuse me, I'll get that, not to worry. And he uh, excuses himself and moves over to the counter and where you see him drop a few copper pieces on the counter. Well, glad to see, glad to see everyone's uh, upright and all right for first time in a while. Yeah, that's great. Listen, so, uh, and Metron comes in and starts to whisper, that guy over there, he's going to set us up with a real nice uh, lodging, yeah? He, he, he's got a whole big manor, but his sister is that Irina that was mentioned in the letter. I, the one being menaced by the, the, the wait, yeah, that, the that woman one. with it. Yes, that one. You hear approaching footsteps. All right, I'm, uh, I noted to your friend, it's not the best vintage, but uh, I do hope you enjoy it thank is, you uh, so much, love. It's perfect, love. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to hear. And he sets down the three glasses uh, in front of uh, Amity, uh, Erthrandir, and Lillison. Lillison's going to... Go ahead. Well, Lillison's going to wait a moment, see if uh, any coins are being exchanged, and then she's going to pull out a silver and just, like, slide it across the table towards his mark. He pulls up his hands. Please, you are a newcomer in, in our lands. Uh, I am more than glad to be hospitable. Please, do not feel as though you have to pay. Oh, you're... Very generous, thank you. Keeper at this point is also going to give Lillison back the money that she gave her for lodgings to before she forgets. Okay, Lillison's going to take four of the gold and uh, push the last one a bit more firmly towards Kiva. We can talk about that later. All right. Is Earth is Mark nods and oh, no, looks toward Earth and Deer. Oops. So, it is, uh, as I mentioned to your friends, uh, my name is Ismark Kolionovich. It is a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, welcome to the village of Barovia, though from the looks upon your faces, I imagine that you would have preferred it to be under better circumstances, perhaps. Yeah, we we would have. Er, Erthen, dear, pleasure to meet you. And he'll shake his hand. Yeah, we, uh, we got a bit lost on our trip, so we... Nothing against your fine village, of course, but we did not en end up here on purpose. So we do appreciate the hospitality. We'll just, you know, we, we do appreciate it. We'll need to head out, of course, but it's always refreshing to find such kindness, even places like this. Is Mark's, is Mark nods interesting. Uh, where are you planning on heading to? Uh, Velaki or Kresk, perhaps? Oh, nah, nah, I don't really know those names. Uh, we're, I'm heading out to, what do the humans call it? Right, right, Daggerford. Oh, that yeah. well, never. That's the one. Thank you. Got mixed up. Thanks, Patreon. Yeah, so we're heading out to Nether uh, Neverwinter. I've got a meeting with a bookseller. Lilith, and you see a shadow cross his Mark's face. That is, um, how to say? I'm afraid, my friend, that that is going. That those do not sound like places, uh, to put it this way, that are within Borovia, I presume. They are uh, other nations, I imagine. I, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know how we crossed a national border, but you humans do like to live close together, so uh, makes sense. I'm afraid. Um, I, I'm sorry. That. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Miss Kiva. Love, I think what he's trying to say is that. Um. It seems as though Barovia is going to be much harder to leave than we initially thought. Well, I mean, obviously, we're in a foreign country. Like, that's going to take some moving, and we have to, you know, get back to... Arthur and dear. As Mark shakes his head, It's at, as Kiva's voice cuts through, and he waits for her. There's no way out. What are you talking about? I am afraid that uh, your friend is quite correct. I am sorry. Anyone who attempts to leave the land of Barovia is 
hemmed in by the walls of fog. You can choke on it and die or turn back. There Amity. is no escape, I am sorry. Amity sort of slams her drink down on the table. We we got rid of the fog. It's yeah, gone. The, the, the fog is gone. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. No, we put it into the... We, we It chased us into that house and then we got out. I, so, yeah, no, I guess a, he, uh, Erfendir is obviously, like, getting a bit hysterical at this point. Well, I, I mean, yeah, we, so that solved, and I, I, we didn't see any, what are you? Do you Kim, remember I know you've been, the, the I know you've been through a lot, but that, that, that's, that's not, <laughs> that, that is Mark, uh, I thank you for your hospitality. I, but this is, no, this is, this is quite ridiculous. Yeah, but like I'm, I'm with Matreon here. There, I, I, I don't. That's not a thing. That is not a thing that can happen. There's not, like, w what you're saying that once somebody gets past the border of your little podunk hamlet, that they just get slapped by what mist? Erthrandir, how else do you explain him never hearing of a place like Neverwinter or Waterdeep or any of the places where we're from? I, he doesn't even know they exist. Well, yeah, no, isolated villages don't. They don't have a reason to. Erthrandir. We Th tried. There literally was mist. We, we, we tried saw. to leave that house. It turned us around. Yes, but, but we, like Emily said, we got rid of it. We got rid of it in that basement. But we didn't get rid of the mist by the gates. I'm sure we didn't. There and did you go and check? We didn't, yeah, like, we can just walk, walk a walk till we get to your border and then we'll just like have you do you know have you ever tried as mark looks like he's being very patient right now <laughs> he slowly sighs i understand why you might feel doubtful you it is it is fine i i am not offended and uh you are doubtless uh uncomfortable with the situation you have found yourselves in but as Miss Kiva has shared with me with the body of the man that you found near the outskirts of our land, Master Davin Nolensky, a friend of my father's. I'm afraid that he, like any other member of our community, has been quite unable to escape the mists or fog of Barovia for the outer world. Our land has been quite isolated for a long, long time, and I assure you, and I am deeply, deeply sorry for this, but there is no escaping this land. There is only the mist. As long as, well, I don't know. I'm going to need another picture, please. Of course, and he gets up and excuses himself once more and heads back to the counter. So, this guy's insane, right? I, like, I truly, I, I don't think so. I don't. He's the son of the man who wrote the letter, and I mean, from everything, the conversation, he truly has no idea about the outside world. Well, yeah, people in these towns don't. They've got... You think traders come through here? Like, you know, want to go out of their way to go to the middle of nowhere? I... But this isn't <sighs> the middle of nowhere. It's a... It's a empty, sure, but developed village. I mean... I, look, he mentioned other places in Barovia, and there seems to be enough people who are surviving here. I'm not saying that the odds are impossible for us, but I am saying that maybe we just need to hunker down and see if maybe one of those traders that you mentioned come through, but I I really don't know. I, tr I trust him. I don't know. I... I, I... No. We got to get out. That's Look, the only way. If, returning footsteps, it is Mark returns with the pitcher. So I, I, I apologize for the wait. I hope you enjoy the wine. Uh, there is a, if nothing else, there is quite a bit of a purple grape mash number three to go around, eh? Please, who, who, who would like some more wine? Hey, thank like you. Wine. Yeah. I'll pass. Of course, and he pours it for uh, those who take it before assuming his own seat once more. Does it, um, does it come in bottles? I'm afraid that, uh, the owner of this establishment does not deal in bottled wine. We could look into purchasing, uh, 
or putting an order in when next the uh, cart arrives, but they have not come in quite a long time, a number of days or weeks at least. I do not know when the winery will make its next shipment. Lillison's going to look over at Metreon, and she is going to say, If uh, I'm willing to uh, ask them to fill up my water skin, if you would let me have some out of your water skin for a while? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, of course. And, uh, and you would see uh, Metreon looks like he's in a bit of a daze, the realization of everything uh, has hit, and he's not looking at anyone directly in the eyes. He's looking through them, almost. Yeah. Alright, alright. Right. So... Go for it. You... You, so there's this mist that you said, and when you walk into it, you know, it, it, it sort of turns you around. Sure, we dealt with that. Has, what have you actually tried to get past this mist? My friend, I... Forgive me. Um, I have personally not dared. Um, I know some insane fools who have attempted, they came out of the mists as corpses, in some cases, babbling with some madness. Others never returned at all. It is known throughout our lands, throughout our history, that none escape from the valley. And if you are thinking of returning there to verify my words, uh, I would urge you great caution. The you presumably have journeyed here through these Swalich woods and, well, while you may have been lucky to arrive in our village, it is prowled by many ferocious beasts. I, w I would urge you be wary, especially if you are to, go are to go there at night. But even during the day, those woods are... they can be deadly. All right. If you, just do not do anything rash, my friend. I, I would ask you only that. Fine. So about this matter of yours. Yes, um, if you would like, uh, given that I, I assume that this is all of the members of your uh, group that have come with you, unless there are any others that you were waiting for? No. There is a pig, though. <laughs> Truffles, snuffles, happily, uh, kind of poking his snout up uh, over Amity's chair, and his mark chuckles. No, that is a uh, good little animal. I am sure that uh, he is welcome to join as well, as long as he is uh, quite well trained. He looks at Amity with an eyebrow raised. Um, sorry, could you repeat that real quick? He is welcome to stay as well, as long as he is, I presume, quite a well house trained. Oh, don't worry. He's 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 very nice. Very good. Then, uh, of course, if you are all ready to uh, leave and you feel all enjoyed your wine, then I'd be more than glad to take you to my home. It is after dark, so we will do our best to make our way through the streets as swiftly as we can uh, but please I will be glad to show you to a warm bed for the night Wilson Thank will uh, very, very much. quickly empty her water skin um, just like drinking up the last few drops and then pour some wine from the pitcher into it yep. Erythrindir is going to stand up but then kind of look regretfully at his wine cup drain it in one shot set it back down and walk towards the door Metrian's already finished his, his probably seventh glass at this point. Uh, he is maybe a little bit wobbly. He does have a high tolerance, but he's a little bit wobbly at this point. Uh, but he stands and uh, doesn't say anything. He just starts to move towards the front of the tavern, towards the door. Erythrindir then remembers and runs back for Amity. Oh, shit, shit, shit. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've, I've got this. I No, I, I don't need your help. I... Are you sure? You really, really shouldn't walk on that foot. Amity's gonna try, like, hopping on the other foot. Make an acrobatics check for me. Okay. Uh, that is going to be... a 21. Woo! You successfully hop your way to the door. Uh, steadying yourself against the door frame. It's a bit awkward, and, you know, Truffle rushes up to you a few times to make sure you're not going to fall the other patrons glance at you with a mixture of frightened and dirty looks as you make your way through 
You see a number of them eyeing the horns atop your head with a dark look. Before... Metron notices some of their glances and will actually go back and like sort of scoop her, uh, and almost shield her from the, their glances from the side. Come on, love, let's, let's just get you out of here. Um, Amity also notices the glances and is just going to directly turn back to everyone else and say like, hey, 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 I know you see I have these horns and I'm all red, but I'm not like a demon, okay? I just look weird. Uh, and she's gonna toss a gold coin to the bartender and says, uh, and say, here, here's the next round for everyone. The bartender slowly takes the gold coin. The dirty looks around you quickly turn back to their tables. The quiet conversation resumes. The barkeep makes no motion to serve wine, just pocketing the gold and a few other dirty and skeptical looks slowly vanish as the others quietly return to their conversations. No one makes any motion to approach the door or the bar. Yeah, I guess we'll just head out with uh, Ismark then. Yep. Sounds good to me. And with that, you exit the tavern, entering once more the dark, misty streets of Barovia. And as the door slowly closes shut behind you, that's where we will take our break. Hey. There we is go. Mark, is Ooh. Mark, is <laughs> Mark, is Mark, is Mark. Is He's Mark. at least is Mark the medium. Is Mark the adequate? Yeah, is oh Mark my the god, adequate. you guys. Jesus fucking Christ. Y'all need Jesus. Is Ooh. that a and long sword you. in your sheath? Dot, dot, dot. Oh god. Yeah. We do yeah. need Lathander, uh, figuratively and literally. Uh, yes. But... Please yeah, help us, reasonable. Lathander. <laughs> Please. If you could just, like, throw a cleric level our way, that'd be great. <laughs> Free cleric levels for everyone. <laughs> yeah, no, that'd be really lovely. It's rules is written, right? <laughs> yep. Well, it says the new... DM, it's milestone leveling. And, like, this is probably a milestone, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah meeting this mark is a milestone, right? That's where all... That's, Are we yeah. level five or six? No, you're still level three. Oh, no, I think I, we're level I, seven. I, God. I'm pretty sure mm. his mark is like four milestones. Mm. God. I think we should have a level up for every every pitcher of wine we ordered. So that's at least three. That's more, that's so. the rule. That's what it is. You're we're right. At least, you're... We're at least level five now. So if we Everyone, walk a mile, edit your and find a stone. All right. Oh. All right. I think I think we'll we'll pick this back up after a fifteen minute break during which I ponder my life decisions and whether or not his mark is worth as many milestones as he, as they seem to consider. Uh, until then, uh, please do enjoy a few other messages from our D and D community, including a new episode of our Fireside Chat series. Uh, this week we have on Zephyr uh, regarding the mechanics of creating an alternate universe campaign of an existing D and D module. Uh, so please enjoy, and we will see you back here soon. Welcome to Fireside Chat, a short interlude with weekly features where I, your host Juplukas, will be showcasing and interviewing prominent D&D creators. This week we are talking to Zephyr, a dungeon master who runs Cursostrad games in alternate settings and a community member of the Arcosostrad Discord server about creating and successfully playing in alternate universes. What is an alternate universe game? Why would you run one? An alternate universe game is a game where you change the setting, genre, or some other detail about the game so radically that the entire campaign is affected by it in an instantly recognizable way. Female Strad, Wild West Barovia, a modern setting, horror comedy, those are all examples of alternate universes. Why you might run one? 
Everyone has their own reasons. My reason is that I love world building, I love creating settings and characters, but I struggle with writing actual stories, making individual combat or exploration encounters, or designing areas just room to room. Working with an existing module like Curse of Strad lets me fully explore a world I've made without having to do any of the actual work that I don't enjoy or sometimes I just don't have time for. What are the major elements of such campaign? What should a dungeon master consider before running an alternate setting? The biggest piece of consideration is that many plot elements of Curse of Strad run off common rules. Strad cannot leave Barovia, Irina is a reincarnation of Tatiana, the Vistani can leave Barovia, there are no gods in Barovia or a way to contact them. When making an AU, always consider carefully if your new setting or genre can accommodate these universal rules, and if they cannot, then you will have to address every plot element that is dependent on that rule being broken. This can be the most time-consuming part of writing an AU, as it requires the most detail work. You should always consider if there isn't already something in existence that does what you're trying to do with COS better. There's a wide world of third party and homebrew out there, and there may already be a full length adventure or a supplement that perfectly captures what you are trying to create with professional level quality. Never be afraid to take advantage of the work other people have already done, it's out there. If a resource is there, there's no reason to put in that work yourself. How do you incorporate the mechanical side of a different setting? Do you reflavor, homebrew, or use other game systems altogether? I've seen DMs spend years making complex webs of homebrew rules that recreate countless real-life systems such as muzzle velocity on firearms or weapon degradation to create the feel for the world they want. But the big thing I would recommend to everyone is Understand that D&D 5th edition is a very abstract system, and that less is more. Reskinning or reflavoring something is the quickest, easiest way to create the exact feel and statistics for something you want, with the least work on you and your players. The best part with reflavoring is that it's already balanced. You don't need to worry about a hand crossbow that has been reskinned as a pistol, or a breastplate reskinned as a ballistic vest, as you already know exactly how well that will fare in combat. Save homebrew for when something simply cannot be reskinned, and always try to favor work that has already been done and play tested by other players on sites like the Unearthed Darkana Reddit, that's a personal favorite of mine. If you still cannot create the experience you want, oftentimes you're better off looking into new systems that capture exactly what you're trying to do or even more abstract systems where you don't have to worry about those really finicky rules. Without going too far into spoilers, what elements of Curse of Strahd lend themselves particularly well to an alternate universe? The things that make AUs easy, or had to do with pre-published modules generally, lie at the high concept levels. Curse of Strahd is a wide open sandbox, while other modules have a sort of funnel or cylinder shape, if that makes sense. Things you change in a cylinder affect things further down the line. If I change a dragon to a rock in another module, then that requires me to change the dragon cult later in the adventure into a rock cult, and that may not make a lot of sense narratively, especially if the theme in the adventure so far had been dealing with dragons. While in Curse of Strad, if I change a monster to a different type of monster, it usually isn't going to make any difference outside of the encounter that specific monster is found in. The second reason is that Curse of Strad is defined more by its genre. It's gothic horror, and changing it to a different type of horror maintains the general feel, tone, and pace of the game, while letting you put it in a radically different setting. Southern Gothic Curse of Strad is much easier to do than an urban spelunking Tomb of Annihilation game. What tips or advice would you give to a dungeon master outlining a different setting than the usual of course, a Shrad or another 5th edition module. My tip is if you want to make your own alternate universe, try and define to yourself the rules that make Curse of Strad's story work. The players are isolated in an area by choice or circumstance. Strad has absolute power to a nearly godlike capacity within that area. There is a person, a sort of living MacGuffin, that Strad wants, and this drives most of the plot. 
the greater cosmology of the world is blocked off and replaced by sinister and ancient beings who may or may not be helping the heroes. If you understand these rules and how and why they drive the story, or make the horror of the world effective, then you are already more than halfway done making an AU. It doesn't matter if you change everyone to be anthropomorphic bugs, set it in a Wild West frontier, an Asian diesel punk island nation, an 80s small town on Earth, or the English countryside in a Victorian London type scenario. The major story beats of the game are going to be the same, and you can concentrate on smoothing over the smaller issues that arise within individual areas rather than having to stress over making the plot as a whole work. Because Curse of Strad's design is centered around self-contained zones or areas in a sandbox, you can easily remove entire zones if they just don't work in your game. And you can replace them with something else entirely. If the werewolf den just does not work in your game world, you can remove it. If Breeze just does not work, remove it. Curse of Strad is designed such that you are not expected to even visit multiple chunks of the game world, you can still reach the maximum level and go defeat Strad, so don't be afraid to take whole chunks of the game out of it if it doesn't serve your purpose. A uh, ending monologue. I figured I'd keep this short and just try to hit the big notes of what I feel about AUs. Thank you all so much for your time, it was incredible to get to share one of my passions with you, and I hope you all have years and years of great gaming. Thank you once again, and have a good one! If you think your hometown has problems, you haven't spent nearly enough time in the village of Barovia. Over the years, their taste for human flesh had only grown. The vampire spawned the undead cult, the werewolf den. I just think we can do a little better here. Grab our shovels and we're gonna add some depth to help you run your best curse of straw. Strawn, strong, strong, strong. Possible. You're welcome. He flies into a fit of rage that is unparalleled. There's child abuse galore through this thing. He's been nailed to the wall with very long iron spikes, and I imagine it's been a very uncomfortable time for him. You see, in tracking a monster, one always needs proper bait.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten. Hope you all enjoyed the break. Uh, before we begin, we just we do just have a few minor announcements. Uh, first, just a quick shout out uh, and thank you to our continuing virtual tabletop sponsor for this campaign, Foundry VTT, uh, for providing the scenes that you or the technology that we've used to show the scenes up here, uh, which are themselves designed by the great James RPG Art on Patreon. Uh, as well as, you know, dynamic lighting and other great features. Highly recommend checking them out. Uh, so, uh, Twy, what have you got? Yeah. Well, as you guys know, we have just recently hit Twitch Affiliate, which I am still jazzed about. I did not expect that to happen when we started this little stream. And that means that, at long last, our three of our new emotes have been approved. We have Perkins Face, we have Doru, and, of course, Truffle who we can now safely keep because he made it out of Death House. Bless his little soul. Yay. Yeah, I'm very happy. So yeah, no, if you would like to subscribe, then we'd be happy to have you. You have several options. During the month of September, your first month, your first month of subbing is significantly discounted. And if you happen to have Amazon Prime, then odds are you have a Twitch Prime sub knocking around that, well, it'd be pretty cool. But... And of course, any money that we get from this is going to back to going to be going back towards supporting the stream and the Curse of Strahd community. So, but we're very thankful for all of your support and sticking with us. Absolutely, thank you all so much, uh, Serena. Do you have some quick uh, social information? I do indeed. So, um, as you can see, designed by our very own um, Jack. We have some new buttons in the bottom that will take you to the R Curse of Strahd Discord server, the R Curse of Strahd YouTube channel that has our playlist um, for all of past all of our past episodes that you might have missed, to our Twitter uh, at TwiceBittenCOS, um, and to our podcast, um, which you can also find at Anchor.fm uh, slash Twice Dash Bitten, um, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, just a reminder that the R Curse of Strahd um, Discord and as it is in the Reddit community are just uh, DM only. Um, so if you're a player, uh, spoilers will abound there. If you would like to submit artwork, ads, or memes, you can submit to um, our email, twicebittencos at gmail.com. Um, if you are sending art, fan art, anything like that, make sure you send it to the email as well, even if you've posted it somewhere like the Discord server or the Twitter. And we have a new Deadpool. Um, as of right now, it's closed because it's closed during sessions. Um, but I'll put the link in the chat for everyone. Um, the Deadpool will go until the next PC dies. Um, and then the rules will be reset and the voting will reopen. Um, so just make sure you do that uh, whenever you can. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Serena. Uh, Kaya, anything to add? Yes, uh, just wanted to remind everybody that, as always, we are highly indebted to all of the uh, video game companies and independent composers who have allowed us to use their music for this stream. You can see those credits if you scroll down. Uh, there is a short list of the music credits, and if you click through on that panel, it will bring you to a sheet with every single track that we are using. Um, I've seen a couple of requests for the particular playlist that Dragna has put together. Um, any chance of those uh, being published anywhere, Dragna? Uh, at some point, I'll be able to look into it. Uh, just things are, you know, obviously a bit busy right now. But uh, if I have the time, I would definitely look to uh, make, uh, you know, at least the, the the lists themselves available for people to look at. So hopefully I should be able to get that out at some point if Kaya reminds me. I will be sure to do that. Uh, speaking of reminders, uh, yes, we do have our podcast, which uh, Serena had already mentioned. Um, it is now up on most of the major places that you can find podcasts, including Spotify, Google Play, and uh, Apple Podcasts. Um, as of now, we have almost 1,200 plays, which is f just mind-blowing to me, um, and also makes me feel like maybe I should put more time uh, into editing these things. But be that as it may, um, each episode is aired um, 12 days after the original uh, Twitch play date because I go through and remove things like dead air, um, stray noises in the background and uh, diversions um, and 
re-upload it for the best possible listening experience. The fireside chats are also uh, available for listening just as their own little series, so check those out. All right, thank you, Kaya. And with that, I think that's all of the announcements that we have for this week. Thank you all for sticking around. And with that, let's dive right back in. And so, exiting the Blood on the Vine Tavern, the door closes behind you and the muffled conversation and clinking of glasses vanishes. As the light drizzle, the distant sobs return in the darkened streets of Barovia once more. Ismark glances over the lot of you, his, his gaze softening a bit as he sees Amity leaning against the doorframe. My home is not far. Do not worry. It is uh, just on the southern end of town. Uh, please, um, Miss Amity, was it? Uh, could I offer any uh, assistance? Do you have, like, a, just like a walking stick or something? Just like a stick should be enough. He frowns. Um, uh, not on me at the moment. Um, perhaps I could find something for you at my home. Uh, would that be all right? I'm sorry I don't have anything on me right now. If I could take your hand, I'd be more than happy to assist you. All right. Amity offers her hand. This Mark takes it with a uh, kind nod, and do, you can tell he's doing his best not to seem to... Uh, you know, rude or presumptuous, but it does his best to let you lean your weight on him as you slowly make your way through the streets at his and the party's side. You're the burgomaster of this town. It is a bit odd. My father was the burgomaster. I have not really had the chance to assume any of his duties as of yet. Um, I fear my sister and I and our father, before we passed, had faced uh, <sighs> an unfortunate situation quite a bit of uh, chaos in our lives as of late and I am hoping uh, with your assistance perhaps to uh, achieve some measure of peace and quiet though I'm afraid that might uh, preclude me from continuing uh, my father's duties for a time we found a letter from your father yes uh, I was told by Miss Kiva uh, for uh, Master Olensky it was a uh, deep uh, tragedy what happened to him. I would ask if he had been buried, but I know that the woods are dangerous. I would not presume to ask such a thing of you. Hopefully his body will find rest instead of joining the others. He closes his eyes and just forms a small uh, shape across his heart with his uh, fingers pointing outward and up toward his chin before opening them and continuing once more on the road. I'm Nothing. sorry, you said others. Join in the others, yeah. It is best to avoid the... Uh, I, I mentioned that it is unpleasant to uh, travel the woods at night. There are spirits and other less wholesome things that wander its uh, gnarled brambles. What? I hope that Master Olensky finds peace. It might be a kinder end if he is... If he serves as food than if he seeks it. Um, Deer looks like he is about to say something and then immediately shuts his mouth. Go for it. So the the creature in the letter, there are more of them than just the one who has been plaguing this place? The vampire... Ah, he looks confused for a moment and then nods. I, I see the confusion. There is... Well, there is a vampire that rules the land. Uh... He uh, dwells in Castle Ravenloft. He does not lurk the woods, I should hope. I sincerely hope, at least. Uh, I know that I believe that there may be other spawn of his that lurk in the land, but to my knowledge, I hope that they have not been sighted in the woods, no. Other uh, shambling things, I should say. Wilson is frowning, um, and she slowly says... You say he rules this land? That is correct. He is the Count of Barovia. Ah, so he rules this in a legalistic sense. It is a bit strange. You see, my people do not 
regard him as a respected lord as such, rather he is he is a devil, a curse placed upon our land. He into the darkness that he brings. We do not view him as one might view a, a caretaker, perhaps. No, he is a, a monster set upon us and our people. We do our best to avoid his notice. Generally, ah. curses are placed upon people who have done wrong. Is there something that Barovia has done wrong? If only that we knew it. It is said amongst my people that the devil Strahd was sent because of a forgotten sin of our ancestors, a, the scorn of old Mother Night, but I do not know. It is what is believed. It is what is understood, but I am no theologian, my friend. Mother I only know that he is a monster. Wait, Kiva right, like rushes into her backpack and pulls out the letter that she got from Death House. This, Strahd? And she's going to show the letter to Ismark. He frowns and look over the letter that you're uh, holding up to him. Strahd von Zerovich, yes, that is the name. I... The Red Lord and Master seems quite appropriate for one such as him. But... Where did this... you find this? In... We were in a house when we first got here. A, a manor... It... Never mind, it... It was in a, a, a secret room in the library, but the body that was over it was long deceased. How long has this man been in power? The devil is ruled our lands for centuries. We do not know. We have not known life without him. Whatever our ancestors did, it was long ago and lost to the mists. He said centuries. Aye, that I did. Probably hell. Is he human? Was he human? That I do not know. I know not the nature of the vampire, but whatever he w may have once been, he is certainly no longer. He is a beast. He is a creature of night, a creature of blood. He and his servants have long haunted our lands. As I said, it is best to evade him where possible, though, as you might have noticed, and he nods up to the shadow of the castle, faintly illuminated by the waxing moonlight. It is difficult in our little village, so close beneath its shadow. You I... said that your father was the burgomaster? That is correct. He served long and he served well. He was... He cared for this village, as I do as well, but he passed quite recently. Did, did this office, did the power of his office come from the Count? Or was it elected by the people here? The Burgomasters are, well, it is, <laughs> I suppose our village ways might seem strange to uh, city folk such as yourselves. I am not familiar, as I have said, with the ways of folk outside the Barovia, except insofar as those that have come here before. Um, it is, uh, Ancestral after a fashion, I suppose you could say, though. I imagine that if the townsfolk were not pleased with uh, my father's performance, they could have found another. So, not directly appointed by this dread overlord? No, I have not. I have not personally encountered this devil, though. But your sister has. That's correct. So I'm I'm sorry to be presumptuous, but I've never encountered a vampire before, and um, I don't think any of the rest of us have. So how exactly can we help your family before we get there and I... before we take advantage of your hospitality? This feels like something that is beyond our wheelhouse. Of course, and I understand completely. You all look tired and you... Well, I hope that that you are hardy folk to have made it here, especially after the experiences you may have had. I do not wish to put you at undue risk. You see, there is a town beyond here. It is called Velaki. It lies in the heart of the valley. Um, it is my hope that, uh, well, it is uh, beyond the reach of Castle Ravenloft. Uh, it is, from what I have heard, well defended. 
uh, beyond the view of the castle and beyond, I hope, the reach of the devil himself. I believe and hope that if I can move my sister from Barovia to this better defended settlement, that we, she may be free of his grasp and I might be able to do what I can to find better comfort for her there. Pardon me a moment. Of course. You mean to say that the lord of your land, you know, big guy up in the castle, is been interested in your sister for one reason or another, and you think a change of location is going to put him off? Moving, what, ten miles? Fifteen? It is, I know it is a risky gamble, but it is our best chance. We have done our best to justify our home, but... Yeah, I... I okay. Ignore that it is well defended. The, devil, the devil's creatures have assaulted our home. You will see when you arrive. It is not simply the devil, but his minions that me and my sister are concerned with. And if we can move her behind its fortified walls, its sentries and guards, we can keep her safe inside. For you see that a vampire cannot enter a residence without invitation. And if he cannot bring his beasts beyond the walls of a locky, it is our hope that there at least we will be safe. Has he, has there ever been record of him in invading Valaki, this Valaki? Not to my knowledge. I confess that I have not been to Valaki, but I, my father's uh, uh, knowledge that has been shared, that what I've heard from caravans that have come from there, I have heard that it is ruled by a baron and that uh, it is, as I have said, quite well defended. So it is my hope that uh, it is beyond the reach of the devil. That's reassuring. Uh, how, how much further to this uh, manor of yours? It's not far at all. In fact, here you can see, and it, it you, you see coming into view now what appears to be a weary-looking mansion squatting behind a rusting iron fence. You can see that the iron gates are twisted and torn. You can see that the right gate lies cast aside while the left swings lazily in the wind. You can see here the stuttering squeal and clang of the gate, repeating with mindless precision. You see weeds choking the grounds, pressing with menace upon the house itself. Yet against the walls, the growth has been tramped down to create a path all about the domain. Heavy claw markings you can see have stripped the once beautiful finish of the walls and great black marks tell of the fires that have assailed the mansion. Not a pane nor a shard of glass stands in any window, all of which are barred with planks, each one marked with stains of evil omen. Well, and, uh, Metron turns around uh, and looks at the others. Uh, the, f the first house that tried to kill us was much better than this, so maybe it's, you know, the inverse. Wait, 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 no. Um, we've been told that this the house has been assaulted by some creatures, and that there's someone inside that a vampire wants to get. Uh, <clears throat> Burgomaster Kornion, uh, I, I am greatly appreciate your generous hospitality, but I think that um, us five might want to find more modest lodgings for the night. It's Mark. Thanks at you. Uh, I'm, yes, Mark, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I, for, I neglected to share. Um, you see, the devil's creatures have not come against our home for the past several nights. That is why I had not returned home prior. I sought some peace and quiet in the tavern. I, I, I assure you, I, to the best of my knowledge, I hope that tonight will be safe, that no harm shall come to you within our walls. And I vow, and he has, you see his hand go to the longsword at his side, that I vow, I promise, Miss Amity, that I shall not allow any harm to come to you or to your friends. Wait, I, you left your sister alone? She is quite house? secure, I promise. The house is fortified. It is safe in there. I I just needed to find help. Please. So, so pardon my questioning, but why haven't you tried to move her already? You seem more than capable of holding your own in a fight. Sized. It is risky alone. The roads can be dangerous and not as dangerous as a vampire or as dangerous as his minions, but I could not risk her. I needed to find more help. I could not dare move her alone. Uh, I, I take it I, that I'm... the plan would have been to move her 
in secrecy to have her disguised, and I assume that sending her off with a, perhaps a group of strangers would draw less attention than the two of you, who presumably are very well known around here. This mark size. It is not quite, though that is an interesting proposal. You see, I had thought to bring her myself uh, to ensure that she got there, but I needed extra hands to make the journey. I would, I could not bear to see her go without knowing that she had come to someplace safe and secure from this nightmare that we have been living. Um, but again, I could not have, I did not think that I could do it without others to help on the road. It is, I am sorry. Metreon has been sort of watching him and having experienced Death House, even though he was kind of joking, he was also sort of, he's not entirely convinced and he's he's been observing uh, Ismark this whole time that they've been walking and now we're in front of the house. He wants to, he's curious to know if he's actually telling the truth about all of this or if he's keeping anything from, from us. All right. Uh, if you'd like to inspect him, you can make an insight check to see if he seems to be holding anything back. Uh, that's seven. Seven? He's tough to read. He doesn't seem to be indicating much beside the somber, slightly mournful expression upon his face. Uh, he's so handsomely brooding, so I'm, I'm totally distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Arithan Deer is going to step forward. Mr. Bismarck, sir. How about this? We will gladly take your hospitality for the night. We are all tired, and frankly, I don't want to know what happened if we try to stay the night out here. Probably nothing good. But in the morning, hopefully, post-breakfast, we will have an answer for you about whether we are willing to help or not. We, I am... Quite frankly, we've been through a tremendous amount. We're all sick, injured, in degrees of shock, I'd imagine. We need time. Miss Buck nods. I understand. It is not a problem, and I appreciate your willingness to entertain the uh, request I have made. Please, let us get out of the cold and the wet. Uh, my house is warm and comfortable. And he uh, holds the gate open, ushering you to proceed into the grounds of the manor. Ismark murmurs to the other. Er, pff, pff, wow. <laughs> dear murmurs to the others. Can't be terribly warm with every pane of glass broken, but he will follow. Good help does seem hard to find these days. Wait, wait, wait. I, I honestly think that just a room in an inn would just be more comfortable and safer from, than this place. From what he said, there is no inn in the town. Look, I can stay up with you. I, I don't sleep, remember? So I can I can keep an eye on you all night, if you'd like. Well, I'll crash with you if you must. Uh, I'll, if it's of any consolation or comfort. I think we're safer here than trying to knock on doors and wait for hospitality. Unfortunately. But I, I'm with you, Amity. I, if something goes bad, we all get out together. No questions asked. We leave as soon as things go sour. Are we saying this in front that's of what we, That's what it's we said last quiet, time. Yeah. Well, okay, point taken. Look, there's no mists in sight. There's there's no children that look like those two hard children did, so I think for tonight, and I was saying this to Metreon earlier, maybe we just just take advantage of a bed and and slip out quietly in the morning and not get ourselves involved with the affairs of a vampire. But there's no shame in, in, in taking something nice after everything that we experienced. You hear Ismark knock on the door, wait for a moment, and then you hear the front door of the mansion creak open. A number of chains making their way across the opening, and you see a young woman's face peering through from the other side. Ismark smiles and remembers, it's me. Irina nods, the woman on the other side nods and slowly opens the door. And 
holds it open. You can see now the woman appears to be a striking young woman with auburn hair who wears a simple white tunic with braided patterns over her shoulders wearing a deep red cloak. And at that, Ismark nods to her, takes a step inside, offers her a brief hug, and then turns. Irina, these are uh, some friends that I brought from the tavern. All of you, this is my sister Irina. The woman inspects each, each of you for a moment and then nods her head. It is good to meet you all. I am Irina. Metreon uh, slides back his hood and does uh, this very stately bow. My radiance. Uh, and he extends his hand as if to like take it to kiss. He looks at your hand for a moment, a shadow crossing your face. Please excuse me if I do not invite you into the home. We have had troubles. And she takes a step back, looking at you expectantly. Uh, Metreon smiles, kind of showing off his golden fang. It's no, it's no trouble at all. Uh, I do believe, though, that your brother could vet for us. He's Mark size. If you would not mind... I cannot extend an invitation. I I am sorry. If, if you... He looks a bit of a twisted expression on his face. You just see Irina regarding you quietly as she says. Well? Kiva will step forward and offer to shake her hand. And um, she's not really looking at Irina's face as much. Um... And she's going to look over at the rest of the group and then cross the threshold. Irina gives Kiva a nod and takes her hand. You see the light beginnings of a smile touch her face. Forgive me, I did not mean to be rude. It is in the times that we have faced, you cannot be too careful. No, it's, Thank um, you. it's fine. Nice to meet you. So then may we come in? And as Metreon says that, he sort of like inches his hand through the threshold. Ismark sighs. As I mentioned, a vampire cannot enter a residence where they have not been invited. If you would... If you are not vampires, you will be able to step over the threshold. Oh, well, very good. Uh, and Metreon struts inside. You could have just said that. And, and I, I'm sorry, it is... I'm sorry, I thought I, These days have been stressful. I appreciate each of you. And he regards Amity for a moment. Is she still outside? If everyone else goes in, then I guess Amity will go in. Melissa is also standing outside. Cool. Amity proceeds inside, joining the others, and... Ismark's gaze falls upon Lillison. He raises an eyebrow silently. Sorry, if Lillison's outside, Amity's also outside. All right. Amity catches herself before finishing her way past the threshold. Come on in, both of you. Uh, it, it's much warmer in here. I understand the precaution. I... Hmm... It seems ill-mannered to barge into a residence like this, but I suppose. And uh, she is going to take a look at Amity and say, Will you need a hand? Um, I'll... I can get in. Amity's sort of looking suspiciously at Lillison, but... Uh, only for because of the freezing. Wilson nods and turns and walks in, trying to, you know, find a place that's as far away from everybody else as possible. And so she proceeds in with Amity, making her way into the old manor as his mark moves and closes the door behind them. Forgive them, they're just very shy. Of 
course, it is not a problem. Um, though for future reference, just so you are aware, I would caution you not to be so cavalier when inviting others inside. There are... well... Point taken. Amity sits down on the nearest chair or furniture or whatever. There's a house down the street. It's it's like big and, and, and with white wooden walls. Three stories. Can you go down there and put some kind of sign on the door that's just like warning, don't come in? Or, or something. Oh my god, you're right. Somebody might stumble in there. Ismark's face looks grim. I am afraid that I believe I know the house of which you speak, and there have been... Well, most of the townsfolk know not to proceed near there, and... Well... It is... Suffice it to say that prior attempts to restrict whatever mind dwells beyond its walls have failed. I am sorry. Does that mean that signs have been taken down? Even I have not placed outside? It is... I have not been personally informed, but... I suppose I can revisit it, if that will ease your mind. I, no, because no, the, please don't. The oh. local people might know to avoid it, but anybody from the outside does not. Your are you a thin smile and nods. Of course, I apologize. I hope that your trials have not been too heavy upon your hearts. You are safe here. And as you look around, you can see the interior of the mansion that you've now entered, seeming to be well furnished, yet though the fixtures show signs of great wear. There are noticeable oddities, the boarded up windows and the presence of holy symbols in every room that you can see from here. Glancing to the side, you can see what you think to be the Burgomaster in a side drawing room on the floor, lying in a simple wooden coffin surrounded by wilting flowers and a faint odor of decay. Irina stands quietly off to the side of the doorway. I'm dreadfully sorry, uh, my lady. Irina offers you a smile. It's all right. I, I appreciate the thoughts. It's been difficult days for me and my brother, and especially in our father's passing. His heart could not take it. It was too soon, but perhaps it was... <laughs> well, perhaps he is in a better place. Do you have plans to bury him? Irina nods. I had hoped to bury him or see him buried into the uh, local cemetery. He must be put to rest so his spirit can dwell beyond with the Morning Lord. Ismark turns to order. Irina, I thought we discussed this. It is. We will do what we can, but right now our priority needs to be seeing you to safety. And Irina shakes her head. No. Our father is dead, Ismark. The proper rites must be performed. You know that as well as I. Ms. Mark fixes her a look. We can talk about this in the morning, and Irina shakes her head. We've talked about it. Please, let us attend to our guests. She turns to the rest of you with a smile. Please, it is... We do not have much to offer at this point, given the... Uh, the weeks that we have endured as of late. But, um... Please, if you would like, I can... See if uh, I'm sure that my brother can fix up a meal for you. I would be glad to see to it that you are comforted. If um, this mark nods, they are staying the night. Perhaps uh, if you would not mind showing them to their rooms, I can put together a, an evening meal. And Irina nods. If you would, if if it would uh, not be too much trouble, I would be glad to show you some uh, some uh, open beds. We do have rooms if you would appreciate. If you show me to a mattress, that will be a greater kindness than I have seen in quite a while after the past few days I've had. Thank you. 
Marina chuckles. Of course, it's not a problem at all. Please, um, if you'll just follow me, it's there are upstairs. We, I don't know that we have enough for all of you, but uh, we can do what we can to make you uh, comfortable. Please. Yeah, I think you'll follow up. Follow her upstairs. You follow uh, Irina upstairs. Are Amity and Lillison proceeding as well? Yeah. Um, Kiva is as well, yeah. And we uses will... the banister to help her sort of hop up. Lillison will wait a bit and uh, try to see where is Mark has gone to. Sure. Uh, you can follow his footsteps as he exits the main foyer. You follow him as he makes his way through the uh, drawing room into a room beyond um, what appears to be a small and homely kitchen with a small attachment to a dining room on the other side and a small stove which you see he appears to lit up with firewood. Are you moving quietly or just kind of, you know, leaning in to watch after him before proceeding upstairs? Um, I'll move quietly uh, but when he stops, uh, Lilson will clear her throat. Alright, make a stealth check for me. That is a 24. All right. Um, you quietly slink through the drawing room, passing the the coffin by and the slight scent of decay as you peer into the kitchen beyond. You see Ismark arranging a number of woods in the oven and beginning to stoke a flame as some smoke begins to rise through a chimney. Um, you see him beginning to move through a small pantry as he pulls out a a few what appears to be hanging steaks and a few vegetables out of a bag and quietly humming to himself he pulls out a chef's knife and begins to chop some potatoes um excuse me he blinks and turns around oh excuse me um miss lillison uh is there something that i can do to help you uh quite the reverse actually i just wanted to say we are very deeply indebted to you for extending to us all this hospitality in your hour of grief. Is there anything I can do to help? Well, that uh, depends. Uh, how uh, comfortable are you with uh, watching over a stew? Well, I, as long as I'm told what to watch for, I'm fairly willing to do so. As Mark chuckles, it is not a problem at all. Here, uh, and he holds out a wooden spoon to you. I'll uh, show you how to get all the ingredients put together. If you could keep an eye out for it boiling, so we know to adjust the flames while I uh, see to it about preparing these steaks. Okay. Um, Lillison is going to think about summoning the mage hand, then rethink it, and uh, edge just close, to, close enough to um, grasp the wooden spoon by the tips of her fingers. His mark seems to note your reluctance to get closer, but just acknowledges it with a nod and returns to his chopping. Wilson is going to be a sous chef for a while. All right, very good. While this is happening, uh, other four of you, Irina leads you upstairs the creaking old staircase until you reach a landing on the upper floor. There you can see the thin moonlight seeping in through the boarded up windows. In some places a chill breeze making its way through, though thankfully modeled by the boards and shutters that have been drawn tight over them. Irina guides you down the hall toward a pair of rooms. She opens the door and you see within a single large comfortable looking bed as well as a slightly threadbare and aged rug in each and a small chest set off to the side. Joining them you see a single uh, large stone fireplace that appears to uh, verge into both of the rooms. Please forgive me, uh, I would be glad to see if we could fetch some uh, firewood to get it warmed up in here. Uh, we were not expecting guests tonight, um, but if you'd like to get yourself set up, um, as best you can. I'm sorry it's not more, but um, again, I'm glad to do whatever I can to make sure that you're comfortable. I'm sorry for the trouble that you faced thus far. I am so your it's, 
It's just the one bed in this room? Uh, one bed in each room. There are two rooms. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> Kiva will help Amati um, get to one of the beds if she needs assistance, and then we'll offer to go get um, firewood to bring up to the rooms with Irina. As you're doing so, Irina watches you helping Amity. My, my, I'm sorry, um, are you injured in some way? Is, is there anything that I can do to help? Um, let's see. Um, my mother said um, ice water. That's what she always did for sprained ankles. Actually, I'm not sure if, if the... Ethan, dear, if, if the bone is broken, could your magic fix it? I will let you know in the morning. Maybe. Uh, Amity uh, pulls up her gimbal to sort of look at her ankle uh, a little bit timorously. Um, is is the bone broken? Is, if anyone knows anything about um, sprained ankles or, or broken ankles or whatever. If no, you could... the, the, uh, uh, a sprained ankle doesn't have blood like that. Yeah, we can, it's, we can it's try... face in the wrong way. Try... <laughs> is the foot even connected? Is that it? Without going into too many of the gory details, it um, there's been a large slash that appears to have impeded the movement of many of the muscles. It, Looking over it, um, if any of you, you would like to attempt a medicine check, I'll allow it to get a better sense of the nature of the injury. I'll give it a try. Uh, I'll, of course. I'll help. Well, that's happening. Uh, Irina uh, holds a hand. Don't worry, I'll be right back. Oh, I just thought of something. Uh, and, and she dips um, out of the room. Yeah. I... I don't know how, but... Something tells me that you know what this is, and you're, you're going to be able to at, at least tell me what it is. Amity touches you and applies the guidance cantrip. You can oh, have shit. Your... All right. Nice. And with the benefit of the help action as well, I believe that's an 18. All right. Looking over it, it's bad. You've not seen too many grisly injuries, but you've seen this one time before. At the time, admittedly, you were inspecting a fox in the woods rather than a tiefling in a house, but as far as you can tell, the tendon has been severed. Several of the muscles disconnected, the ankle itself damaged. It's unlikely that she'll walk on this foot again. Even with magic? You've heard of magic reaching the power that could resolve this, but it's regeneration healing of a power to an extent that you've scarcely heard of. It would take a, an exarch of a church or some other creature of great healing power to restore this. It's far beyond your capabilities. He puts a hand over his mouth. I... Oh. Is it broken? I I, I know it's supposed to hurt a lot yeah. if it's broken, but I, I can't even feel it, to be honest. Amity, uh... He kind of looks at he kind of looks at the others as if entreating them for help and then just kind of turns to her and sits down on the bed next to her. You uh that scythe blade caught you really, really bad. Um it looks like the tendon severed, which is not a thing my magic at least can fix. I can patch up the foot, but uh I uh I mean, th th I don't know this, but I, I'm, I'm, I don't, th there might be a possibility, but I don't think you should be walking on this for a long while. I, uh, it might, it's not going to get better at minimum for a long time. It might not get better. So you're, you're telling the truth, but not the whole truth there? Yep. Okay. Amity sort of um, wraps her tail around her face. Uh, 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 it, it was a tooth. What? It looked like a blade. 
but there were teeth. The house bit me before I left. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, yeah, uh... It got a few good bites in, and uh, Metreon rubs the collarbone where he still has the deep gash. You were the only one who made it through. Did you... Did you get us out of here? Yeah. She asks Ethan Deer. Yeah, that was me. With your magic. It's I think it's the only thing that gave me the willpower to keep going after it bit me too, but yeah. Yeah, that was me. Amity goes to like hug into your chest and just wants to sort of bury her face somewhere. Aerithrin Deer looks uncomfortable, but is going to wrap his arms around you and just kinda hold you. I'm so sorry. I'm I'm so so sorry. We we got out and we're gonna get out of here. The missus is it's, it's gonna be gone. And if it's not, then we'll then find we'll... you know if that house had an an altar at the bottom that we had to pillage, get rid of that mist, then the other mistresses has to have one too. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. We're gonna make it out of here. Don't worry. Don't worry. He's just going to kind of hold her as long as she's going to hold on to him. There's a moment of silence, and then you hear the door to the room open and close again. Or just open, rather. And you see Irina standing there in the hall, clutching something to her chest. From the looks of it, it seems to be the a long plank from a table or something that has been broken or shattered as such, and you can see that nails have been crudely put together through it, uh, attaching it to a few other pieces of debris. It's uh, perhaps the height of Amity's shoulder, if maybe a few inches lower. She hugs it to her chest. I'm sorry, if was, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, of course not. Herthen Deer just, pulls away. What is I just, it? I just noticed that, um, Miss Amity, you seem to be having some trouble, um, I don't know if something happened, um, but in case you needed something, I'm, I'm sorry if this is a bit too forward, but um, I had a few uh, extra boards lying around and thought that this might help. And she holds out the uh, modified plank, and you realize in the light that it looks very faintly like an improvised crutch. Amity uh, tests it out. Irina kind of like holds her breath for a moment visibly, but it seems to hold your weight. Amity's going to try to uh, summon her spirits up and get as athletic as she can with this improvised cane, like trying to like jog in place, jog in a circle around the room, maybe try to like kick something. Make an acrobatics check. Uh, Okay. Is this a check to balance or just straight up acrobatics? It's an eight if, if it's just straight up acrobatics. Uh, straight up acrobatics, yes. And you do your best to kind of, you know, hop in place and, you know, you succeed for a moment in, you know, jogging in place. But as you begin to move away from your initial spot, something slips. And as you do, Irina dives in to catch you. Wait, no. Are you okay? Metreon does the same. I'm I'm fine. I'll 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 practice. We've got you, love. It's just take it easy, okay? Thanks yeah. for the the cane. Nods okay. and slowly pulls back. You uh, must be really something to put that together that fast. That's incredible. Irina gives you a bit of a dry smile. My family has had the. Um, a rough few weeks. I've grown very accustomed to boarding up windows very quickly. This was not that much different. Oh, oh, I'm, oh, goodness. I, uh, yeah, no, that would make sense. Terribly sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Metron shoots him a glance, just like, <laughs> ah. 
<laughs> he stops. I know it's not a professionally made or anything. I, I know that Ismarak wants to... I don't know that what your plans are, but... Um, it's possible that, you know, if, if you're looking for something better, that um, another town might have something, someone more professional to make. I'm, I'm afraid that there's not really... I don't know if there's anyone who might be able to make something of comparable or of decent quality in Barovia, but I hope it suffices for now. It's a hell of a lot better than nothing. Thank you. Uh, what what should I call you? Uh, Miss Koyana? Irina? Just Wojcik, Irina or... is fine. Please, um, don't worry about it. Fair enough. Thank you, Irina. And uh, He kind of turns to Amity. I bet you're going to get the hang of that thing, no problem. Amity gives you a grim smile. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't slow me down too much to um, make me late to my job interview in Neverwinter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right. <laughs> oh. He, he sounds a little, like, desperate. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Uh, let's hope. Never know, we can maybe get all that stuff that pool, all that stuff that Metreon got, and buy you a horse. Oh, shit. I'd love what? a horse. I don't have that anymore. What do you mean? The, the My banner that I brought, I, I left it outside of the house when we went in, but when we came out, I don't, we didn't get it. You're... Your banner? What do you yes, mean? Yes, my, my, my performance banner, the one that I was taking to Neverwinter to perform with. Oh, oh, that's on Fort. Well, I mean, I guess the Mist took your cart. I guess they took that, too. Oh, no, gosh, I, I had, a, yeah, you all mist. were carrying it for me when we got there. I just, uh, I'll, I'll have to go back in the morning. Well, I don't know. I, I, I should rest. We should rest, Arena. Your hospitality has been uh, most uh, gracious, and uh, I would love to know if you have any more of that fine vintage that uh, your brother turned me on to uh, at the blood. What is it, the blood on the vine tavern? Blood in the vine? I... Yes, um, that uh, I, I'm afraid I don't have any of it uh, with me here. Um, the um... The tavern, I'm sure, would have more, but I'm not sure how much later they might be open. Um, uh, regardless, um, and at this point, um, a delicious smell begins to waft into the room, and Irina's eyes brighten. It smells like uh, Ismark is making some progress on the a meal. If, if you'd like, um, I can go get down and check on that. If any of you would like to come, uh, I would be glad to uh, get you set up with some firewood so you can keep warm in here. Um, and then uh, we can have a meal. How does that sound? That sounds fantastic. Thank you, Irina. We'll just, yeah, we'll stay up here for the moment. Or I will, at least. I, uh, need a pre-dinner rest. Kiva, maybe perhaps you could, uh, help Irina with the firewood. No problem. Uh, and maybe, Amity, I'll, I'll bring you up some of the food so you can rest. Sure. Thank you. With that, Irina nods, and she and exits the room, Kiva, I believe, following behind, and moves to fetch some firewood. And is there anything you'd like to do while she and Kiva are gone? Or is there anything Lillison would like to be doing while she's sous chefing, or are you just resting for the moment? Erythrindir's just resting. Uh, Metreon is trying to decide which of the two rooms he's going to set himself up in. Uh... Obviously not the... He's, he would like a bed, so he's going to probably set himself up in the room that isn't being occupied uh, with Amity. Uh, so he'll kind of stake his claim, uh, put his bag down on it, and uh, he's going to... Is Do we know if there's any kind of, like, uh, bathroom or any kind of water on this floor? Uh, looking around, you did notice what appears to be a small... Um, like, a, a, a bathroom as such... Um, 
Glancing he just wants to like some place so he can like clean off the blood that's on his back and on his collarbone. There does appear to be a bit of a, a, a pipe mechanism set up that could flush a bit of perhaps rainwater from the roof into a bucket. Um, similar to the one you found in the previous house, but you know, functional this time. Okay, yeah. He'll take he'll, he'll take some water, uh, dab it on his collar, uh, take off his shirt, kind of wiping his back. Uh, he'll uh, heartily g- uh, gulp up some of the, the water, realize that it's messed up his makeup, and then go back to his room to touch it up. All right. As that occurs, Kiva, you and uh, Irina make your way downstairs, and for a moment you think she's heading for the front door, and then she takes a sharp left into a small closet off to the side of the entryway pulling forth a number of logs and offering them gratefully to Kiva. Once you're, once she's passed over the fire, which she nods, I'll go check on um, my brother to see um, I, I, I assume uh, Miss Lillison is with him. I'll be uh, back shortly. Stairs and deliver the firewood to both of the rooms. All right. Uh, Kiva returns to the room and sets up the firewood and with without too much trouble and after Irina returns, you're able to you know get a fairly cheery fire stoked reasonably quickly. A few moments later you hear footsteps approaching up the stairs and you see uh, Ismark and Ismark carrying a tray of several bowls and plates. Is Lillison helping with this? Um so while Lillison had been sous chefing, um mm-hmm. she is going to have tried to get Ismark to just chat about some of the places in town, um, specifically asking more about this general store and then asking whether there are other like shops or anything like that. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, so a brief rewind then. Um, back in the kitchen before you, Ismark had brought the food upstairs, um, Ismark gives you a, a look and shrugs. Well, I suppose the best that you would find regarding um, a store would be Bildras Mercantile, as I mentioned to your friend. Um, the owner can be a bit ornery, though his nephew is kindly enough. Um, he's not the most uh, negotiable with outsiders, though, so... R- other than that, we do not have many stores. Most of our commerce has closed up or left or fallen to more unsavory and savory ends over the years. Barovia has not taken its time beneath the castle well, I've, I'm afraid. I've heard that Velaki is much better off, though. So perhaps if you're looking to purchase something, if Bildras does not have uh, sufficient quality that you seek, perhaps you might find something there. I did note that um, our friend Amity did tend to draw a lot of eyes. I assume that tieflings are not a common sight here. Mm, not simply tieflings, is that, if that's what they are called. Um, no, they are most certainly not. Um, our folk, you see, um, we know that there are other exotic creatures beyond the mists, and on occasion, outsiders do come to our lands, but we are ordinary folk. We do not know much of the uh, strange uh, ancestries that might linger beyond the mists. Even yourself, um, if I am not being rude, uh, the curvature of, of your ears is uh, quite unique to my people. Well, I suppose I shall take that as a compliment, but yes, I had wondered whether any would deal with us here, especially after seeing the way that Amity was received and perhaps that makes the fact that nobody wanted to open their doors to Erthrandir a bit more understandable. You will have to forgive uh, any the, any that you might have encountered on the streets. Um, our folk are not often trusting of outsiders on even the best of days. And, well, you will have to forgive my people for their hostility towards uh, Miss Amity. And they are unused to seeing um, such unfamiliar uh, biologies, I should say. And I... given the circumstances in which we live, it is it has become a rational response, I'm afraid, for many to uh, fear what might be unfamiliar. Though, I do agree that it is unjust. I, I understand. It's very difficult to accept anything that you haven't 
really seen as part of your life before. But I was wondering, um, as I have said before, you're doing so much for us and we're so obliged, but would it be possible? We, we're missing many um, useful supplies and it, it sounds like this general store owner of yours may not wish to deal with us fairly or perhaps at all. Would you mind perhaps going on our behalf? I could certainly do so, but um, I unfortunately do not believe that he would deal any kinder with me as he would with you. Um, ah, is he that just one of those kinds of people same, then? Unfortunately, yes. Um, his motto is that he does not believe in bargaining as such, and given the darth of uh, other competitors in our village, unfortunately, he um, gets his way more often than not. Uh, I do not imagine that he would be unlikely to serve you um, to build the Wrath Gold as gold, but he is he can be a miserly man, I fear. I see. Well, thank you. I will do what I can, I suppose. Um, oh, and I, as she sort of edges closer to um, the cooking fire, I know that there's probably not enough room for, well, five extra guests. Um, would you mind terribly if I slept in the kitchen tonight? Is Mark blinks. Not at all. Um, I could do what I can to keep the... Uh, the hearth burning. I, I, I'm sure you won't be as comfortable, I'm afraid, but if it would suit you better, I, I wouldn't mind. Is there something wrong with the bedrooms upstairs? I can see to it that they are fixed for you. Oh, no, no, not at all. I I have just been... Um, it's been very cold, and this fire feels nice. Of course. Um, it would not be a problem at all. Thank you. Anything else that Lillison would like to discuss? Or at this point, you see uh, Ismark kind of pull the last of the steaks onto a platter set with a, a chunk of bread and a few other vegetables. And he turns toward you. Is it, uh, how, is it been bubbling nice and uh, thick yet? Yes. It should have uh, congealed a bit around the spoon. Uh, yes, it's it's thickened up a bit. And um, I, I think I once heard this described as a, a rolling boil. Yes, yes, that is very good. Um, and it looks like the the uh, ingredients are nice and tender. Excellent. Uh, if I can get some bowls, then we can bring you and your friends up some meals. I, I presume after the day that they've had that they would not wish to uh, leave their views. I'm sure that they are very, very tired. And regardless, uh, our dining room, um, as I'm sure you've noticed, is not really um, worthy of accepting such fine guests at this time. Oh, uh uh, don't concern yourself about it at all. Um, I think everyone would be most happy to have just any hot food. Um, I think I'll stay down here, though. Of course, not a problem. I'll, uh, if you don't mind uh, pouring out some of these stew into these bowls, I'll bring up some chairs to your friends. I'm sure they don't wish to sit on the floor. Uh, I'll do what I can to make them comfortable. You're so kind. All right, and with that, uh, he makes his way upstairs, delivering a number of chairs, and soon thereafter coming up with trays and bowls, though not Lillison, and says, All right, um, dinner is served. I'm sorry it took a bit longer than expected, but I do hope you enjoy. Um, I did my best to make it as palatable as I could. I'm afraid I don't have many of the uh, fancy seasonings that city folk might have, but it's hardy food. It should fill you up. Where is our companion, Lillison? Uh... She's not the steak, is she? <laughs> oh, no, not at all. That is that is wolf steak. Uh, that, your friend said that she wished to stay downstairs. I believe she found the uh, the fireplace uh, of the hearth uh, quite warm and welcoming. I, I I can let her know if you wish to uh, speak with her further. But um, nah, you've her. been you've been on your feet all day. You don't need to carry our messages down a flight of stairs. Just, just uh, if you could. Uh, she does have uh, a wine skin. Uh, if you could be so gracious as to uh, ask her to either bring it up or perhaps pass it off to you. I, I feel like wool steak would pair well with the, uh, the particular wine we had at uh, the tavern. She nods. 
Of course, I don't mind at all. One moment, please. And he ducks out of the room. Kiva takes her um, bowl, and then she's also going to go downstairs and, and sit with Lillison, if Lillison will have her. Um, Lillison will, you know, you'll, you'll find her sitting very close to the fire, sort of um, eating bemusedly out of her own bowl, and she looks up as Kiva approaches, and she kind of scoots backward a little bit. Don't worry, I, I won't make conversation. I just figured a warm place to eat might be nice. Oh, I don't mind conversation. Just, you know, don't get too close. Of course. Uh, Kiva will sort of sit on the opposite side of the room. Uh, just, you know, politely, but, <laughs> you know. With, All right. Uh... And Metreon, uh, you were saying something? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, uh, so it's just Amity, Metreon, and Randy, in, er, I'm sorry, Aerith and Deer <laughs> in the, uh, it's four yes, at this it's point. The three of you. You're yes. fine. Um, You're fine. Irina excuses herself. Um, if, I, I, I'll, I'll leave you to it. I'm sure you're very tired. I'll uh, take my meal downstairs. No, 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 of course not. You, I, I insist you stay and have a meal with us. She blinks, then smiles a bit. Okay, um, if you're Willing to have me, of course. Thank you very much for the invitation. Seems like such a lonely place around this here Barovia, especially in this manner of yours. It um, it can be a bit quiet at times, but um, my brother is uh, good company, and um, well, it's not often that we see outsiders either. We do what we can. Your your villagers. Uh, the people, your neighbors, they don't seem to take too kindly to my friend here. And uh, he tilts his head back towards Amity. She frowns, looking toward Amity. I'm sorry if you've faced any difficulties, and she kind of purses her lips. It, um, I know some of our neighbors can be a bit um, unfriendly to outsiders. It's, it's not their fault entirely. They, many of them do not know much more to be on the village, but I, I'm sorry if you've encountered anything untoward. Your brother had mentioned there were uh, two other settlements nearby, v v Valakai and uh, what was it, Kresk? Crazy. Yes, that would be Valaki and Kresk. Um, Valaki in the heart of the, the valley and Kresk to the, uh, to the west beyond it. Have you visited them? Have you visited them before? Do you perhaps know if there's the same chance for prejudice uh, for my friend here? Of course. That much I do not know. I'm afraid. Um, Velaki seems to be a larger town than Barovia. Perhaps it is more. Um, uh, what is the word? Uh, Cosmopolitan. Yes, that's that. Thank you, thank you. Um, Kresk. Um, I know that it is a village. It, it, it is quite fortified. Uh, as far as I know, they keep to themselves. But it is built around an old abbey, so perhaps they will. You will find more uh, welcome there. Oh, is it? Oh, that is what I've told. Yes, I don't know much more than that. I'm afraid. Ah, no, it seems like an interesting place to visit. We, that'll that be that'd be cool. Although that does bring me to another question. I presume everyone here in this village is human. Yes, that is correct. But well. Yes. That's a that was a qualified yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um there's um well a superstition about um a certain folk that occasionally come and go through the town. Um Oh, so there three are of, the three owners of the blood on the vine are there is some suspicion of them. As far as I know they are human, but uh, some of uh, some of the others in the town do not quite agree. Well, fair enough, but the way your brother was talking earlier, it seemed like that, you know, people like us coming in wasn't uncommon, you know? So, are there, have you, he's kind of struggling for what to say. Did any of them ever decide to stick around, or are you just at a time where nobody's ever wandered in? She kind of frowns and doesn't quite meet your gaze. 
He's quiet for a moment. I don't know. Um, I've seen some come through here, but I confess I don't know what became of them. I'm sorry. No, that's entirely yes. fine. Except, well, there is one which kind of winces. There are those that came from the outside. Um, not as yourselves, uh, you know, wizards and warriors and knights. Um, they are still seen in their own fashion. But, but what? what do you mean in their own fashion? <sighs> there is, well, I'm sorry, I, I don't wish to discomfort, just... Ma'am, we're asking. If you, go to the, if, you, if you go to the cemetery at midnight, you will see them. That's I'd, all I can say. That is not comforting. They, they, they are not harmful. They are not dangerous. It's just... What I mean to express by this is that their... The best fate does not always meet those with the best intentions. I don't know what became of all of them, but... Are you saying that the dead walk? Not the dead as such, but... Their spirits in a fashion live on. So... You've had folks like us come through here. And the only ones that you've ever seen again are the ones that are ghosts? Yes, but... They, they, they made, they did something that you have not done. To, uh, do not, do not fear. They, that's they are, they are the remnants, insult, man. <laughs> they are the remnants of the devil's enemies. You are not, you have not opposed him. You have not angered him. You are. You're Look, saying there's... that the folks that come through like us are coming through to challenge Strahd? That was his name, right? Mr. Bonjarovich? Slowly nods, uh, either because they wish to combat him or because they find themselves in Barovia and they come to the belief that his death will free them somehow. It is a damnable fate. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't wish to turn your stomachs while you're eating. I'm sorry. It, it was well, if I hadn't problem. already finished my food, I'd probably not feel like eating any more of it. Uh, this is quite a tale you spun. Matreon, we asked. No, no, I, I don't put any blame on you, uh, Miss Irina. Uh, it's just a lot to take in. So, with that, uh, I'm going to excuse myself for the evening. Uh, but first, I will find Lillison with that damn water skin. And uh, Metreon gets up and starts to head down towards uh, Lillison and Kiva. <laughs> All right. At this point, you do bump into Ismark in the hall. Oh, I'm sorry. You... Oh, hello. <laughs> I'm sorry it took me so long. I had to deal with another quick chore. Um, you wanted the wine skin. Um, uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, thank you for the wine skin. Uh, and no apologies necessary, of course. I'm sure the big chores you've handled are uh, much more pressing. He quickly bows his head. Please, um, I, I will be, uh, my sister and I will be asleep in our rooms, um, but please let me know if you or your friends need anything. We are, we, we are, well, we are light sleepers these days. I do not mind um, doing I would again. hate to keep you up so late, but uh, I will make sure to let you and your sister know if we need anything. Of course, and he steps aside and makes his way past you in the hall. Uh, Metreon kind of watches him go up the steps, bites his lower lip a bit, and uh, goes downstairs. All right, you descend the stairs, and there find Kiva and Lillison finishing up their own meals in the kitchen. Boy. Uh -huh. Thank you uh, again, Lil, for the water skin. So, uh, we stay here tonight. We uh, get getting out of here in the morning. Is that, is that, is that his plan? 
DM, uh, did Ismark actually take the wine skin from Lillison? Oh, sorry, I assumed that you would have given it to him. I apologize. Uh, would she have given it to him if asked? Mm hmm. Um, for the sake of simplicity, uh, let's just say yes. All right, apologies. Um, if you want to continue. I... Hmm. Is, is your thought that we just leave? Yeah, I mean, you, you want you want to you want to go on this uh, mission? The devil himself uh, eyes all on us. No, of course not. But uh, angering powerful people in a position of great respect is not a good idea. Listen, I don't care who I'm upset if once we're out of here, they're they're, they're behind us. It, it, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant to us. Assuming that we can leave them behind us, and if well, they claim if they claim that we are trapped, then well, it's best not to burn bridges before you know that you can cross the river. Well, I'm just saying, as we get to Valakai, uh, you know, we leave this shithole behind. Uh, you know, maybe re up on some better supplies there, and uh, you know, maybe there's someone else there who knows a bit more than these old, old folklore folk. Well, if we're heading that way anyway, it doesn't make sense to not take them up on what they're offering, except for the whole you know, bloody fucking vampire uh, having eyes on her and wanting to chase her down, kind of puts us in the crosshairs as well, didn't it? Well, Lillison mentioned that if we offer to disguise her, I mean, you seem to be quite adept at makeup. Uh, and hair, too, I mean. But I, I don't like to brag. You don't need to brag. It looks very convincing. So, I don't know. Maybe we... we Look, I'm, I'm not saying we put ourselves at risk. We've already done so much and lost so much. So, I'm just saying if we're heading there anyway... We, you know? How Wait, you're backing be? out of a plan on me, I know. I'm just saying, seven can defend better than five, especially if, well, I don't think that Amity will be able to, um, run very quickly. And look, if these people have money, maybe we can offer some sort of a, um, a fee for our services. Something will give us a leg up in Valkai for buying nicer supplies and getting out of here. Oh, now you make some sense. Uh, and at this point, Metreon starts to look around Kiva and uh, uh, and Lillison to see if there's any drawers or cabinets. And if there are, he's going to like very quickly look through them to see if there's like fine silverware at all. All right, make an investigation check. Oh, damn, a natural one. <laughs> Oh, oh no! Like, like, you don't find anything of uh, evident value. And yeah. as you quickly search through the drawer, you hear footsteps coming down the stairs. Uh, Metrian slams one of the doors shut. You know, for people who live in a fucking manor, it's got piss poor silverware here. Uh, t didn't you just eat your soup with those spoons? Well, you know, some people like to keep their fine things for, you know... Uh, for other guests somewhere, you know, find China and all that. You hear the footsteps approach and Ismark pokes his head in. Is everything all right in here? Do you all need anything? Yes, everything is perfectly adequate. Thank you so much, Ismark. Of course. Do let me know. And he uh, exits once again. That's one fit bloke, isn't he? What? No, I'm just saying he's, you know, he's a good looking guy. <laughs> Far from my time. Yeah. But no, the the reason that we wanted to get supplies and then get out of here... Amity, you're because... not here. Oh, sorry. Is this happening? This is like, still... Yeah, we're this is in the kitchen. kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Sorry. sorry All right. Amity. Well, uh, can I just go down? Because I feel like, I guess, I've not yes, been... You can... You're currently alone with Erethrindir if you'd like to converse with him or if you'd like oh, to sure, make yeah. way downstairs to follow Metreon. 
Hearthrendir kind of notices your antsiness. Want to mm -hmm. go see what they're scheming about? Yeah, anyway, Amity comes in. <laughs> okay, you arrive. But I guess I haven't heard any of this, so whatever. <laughs> oh, hey, love. We're just uh, gabbing on about, you know, uh, not, not much. Uh, how you feeling? Mostly tired. I've, I've been awake for a while, not counting the um, time I fell asleep in the road. Yeah, it, it's all trips taking a lot out of us. Everybody, I think. Listen, we're we're just talking about you know getting to Valakai. Uh, some folks is thinking maybe we bring uh, this arena with us, uh, despite some objections. Uh, but you know, if we get to Valakai, maybe we can set you up for something that's a little bit more permanent. Maybe get you a nice cane or something. The Emily sort of shakes her head, confused. The whole reason that we wanted to get supplies is so that we could get out of here and not be associated with that vampire. I know, I, I agree, but... Not, like, I've, and, and I don't know why you're suggesting teaming up with the girl who is the only person we know who is directly associated with the vampire. And I agree, which is why I said that some people, myself and you, might have uh, reservations, but, you know... Uh, there's also the possibility of, uh, you know, maybe making a profit out of this and, you know, making this uh, trip of ours a little easier. Ether, you have to agree, right? Like, following this girl around is, it's just not, it's not a business. He looks between Amity and Metreon and the others and gives out a long, low sigh. What I think is that we're tired, we're scared, and we're in over our heads. Any, I wouldn't trust any decision we make tonight. I know it's not a satisfying answer, but it's an answer. And who knows? I don't think going with her is a good idea, but from the look of Mr. Bismarck there, he seems like a better combatant than any of us. No offense, man. And, well, except maybe Kiva, I don't know. But I think that, from what Irina told me upstairs, I think we might have the devil's attention one way or another. What do you mean? She talked about... I asked her what had become of the other non-human outsiders who'd come through here. Once they left the village, she never saw any of them again. But they just went home, uh, right? No. I mean, like... Okay. No, not quite. I mean, I noticed you talked about the spirits and all that, but uh, someone's had to have gotten out of here. I'm sure they have, but she mentioned directly that they had ended up opposing this Strahd von Zarevich or whoever. Why? Uh, to try to usurp him? To... to I, I don't know. Um, why else would you challenge someone who rules an entire country? Because she said... Escape. She mentioned that. So there you me. think that we have to kill him to leave? I'm her? not saying anything. I'm just passing along information. Emily, hey, you've got some, some book spots there. Have you ever heard of anything like this? Like something that keeps people trapped and all that? Um, there's plenty of stories where people are trapped, though. Uh, but does it say like you, you killed a big evil uh, so and so and it lets you out? Like, it, I don't know. I, it, all this is, is very much beyond my comprehension. So I'm just trying to figure things out myself. Well, sometimes if you're trapped, you can throw the witch in an oven and 
get away. Other times you can outwit your captors and run or sneak out. And Maybe. sometimes when you're trapped, that just won't change. No matter how hard you try, no matter how loud you scream, no matter how much you wish it to be otherwise. Oh, that's fucking grim, Lil. Uh, on that note, I'm gonna get me some rest. And uh, at this point, he starts to open up Lillison's uh, water skin and his own and starts to pour some of it into his. And uh, once it's at least half full, he'll screw the top back onto Lillison's water skin and toss it back to her. Yeah. Did you have water left in yours? I don't have anything in this. In this. Should have filled yours up then too. I did. He jingles it in front of you and starts to leave. I, I meant back <laughs> when we were. Oh, oh fine. And in, in a very low voice, Arthur murmurs, "Alcoholism is a hell of a drug." I know. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, dreadfully sorry. I didn't know if that hit close to home. I don't know your situation. Yeah. Uh, not no not not my situation. I just figured that uh, keeping some would keep him yeah reasonable. Probably wise. He did get a little shirty in the house, rather unpleasantly. And then he kind of listen. Tonight, I uh, I think I've remembered a spell. Irina mentioned something about something at the graveyard that happens at midnight. I'm 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 gonna go, but I'd be quite happy to have your companionship if you'd like to come along. What sort of something? <sighs> something about the spirits of those who came before us. She she said they weren't harmful, but. I don't know anything else. I completely understand if you don't want to go. Lillison looks at Kiva. I I I don't want to go if I'm not invited, but I, I I'm happy to accompany if that's what you want. No, I And then he kinda t catches himself. I want you to do what you want. I uh I'm very happy we're at this arrangement right now where you're all safe and healthy, but I think our ties to another are well and dissolved at this point. Anything beyond this is willingness. Your call. Uh, how, DM, how much longer do we have until midnight? Looking out of the window, the moon has risen above the horizon, and it seems that by now it's fairly late at night. Perhaps another hour or two, best you can guess. Well, um, I, I'm happy to go with you and, and see what is going on. I mean, if it spirits that sort of um, a morbid curiosity, pardon the pun, but um, I think... After that, as long as we get some rest, I'm I'm fine to go along. Thank you. Metreon, Lillison? Or, sorry, Lillison? Uh, Amity's there, not Metreon. Yeah, Lillison? Amity? I... Hmm. Lillison sort of edges closer to the fire. I think I'll stay, but... Do be safe, all right? He nods. Gotcha. I'm actually interested in this. All righty. Well, then the three of us. Can't use that spell I was thinking of, but I'll save it. Might still be useful. Well, let's, uh, I guess we should get some rest till then. Don't want to be caught unawares until nod at them and head up to his room and then kind of comes back down actually uh how are we doing the bed situation just boys girls or 
What are we feeling? I can um, sleep anywhere, so if someone wants to take the bed, I'm I'm fine to sleep on the floor. I'm staying here. I, uh, Kiva, you nearly died. Please don't sleep on the floor. You carried all of us out of there, I think. <laughs> you uh, just... More of a poly system, but yeah. Tell you what, I'll... I'll go sleep with Matreon. You take bed with Amity. That seems fair enough. Don't worry, I'm not much of a cuddler, Amity. Well then, he's gonna head up to. He's gonna head up and try and get an hour or so of transcend before he has to go. Before, right, this... yes. oh sorry. I was just saying, before Kiva goes upstairs to follow, she's going to go into the room with um, Kolyan, and um, out of her backpack, she's going to um, pull a small, like, handkerchief, and inside there are just a couple sprigs of lavender, um, and she's just going to lay them um, on Kolyan's body and uh, make a little sign um, in Elvish, and then head upstairs. All right, anyone else? Or are you turning in for the next hour or so? Uh, Metreon has gone up to the room that wasn't occupied by Amity. Uh, he's taken over the bed, and everything that was in his sack, like all his makeup and all the other stuff that he's been carrying with him, is just kind of splayed out very <laughs> on the bed, uh, as well as his coat, and his, his tunic, um, and he's just kind of like he's he's uh, just kind of going through everything uh, until he goes to to rest. Yeah, no, Arthur Deer kind of barges in as he's doing it and just looks at the bed. Uh... You mind terribly clearing that off? Why? Because I gotta sleep. There's a there's a carpet on the floor if you need it. Metreon. It's right don't down there regret. by the hearth, you know. I'm sure it's much Don't make down me. There. Metreon. I lowered you to the ground from the third floor balcony. Don't make me regret not dropping you. Metreon sucks on his teeth a bit and clenches his jaw. Alright, fine. Fine. Feet to head, though. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. And, and pillows in between. How old are you, six? I... I... Look, I have no... I'm fine if you want personal space, but I promise you that I'm going to leave you well alone. <laughs> good, good, yeah. And uh, Metreon will begrudgingly scoop things back into his bag uh, and, like, start putting in the pillows in between the bed. Erythrindir lets out a long sigh and then just kind of starts stripping off his robe and tunic and then kind of Settles in, settles in, feet to head, determinedly looking the other way as he builds the pillow wall. <laughs> yeah, he's just gonna finish the the pillow wall and then wipe off the rest of his makeup. Uh, he leaves some of the the shoe polish in his hair, which makes it kind of a grayish white at this point. Um, but yeah, he'll turn in. All right. With that, each of you turns in now. When those that trance keeping an eye on the passage of time and eventually Arthrundir and Kiva you feel that an hour or so has passed and it's perhaps 30-40 minutes to midnight Arthrundir awakes groggily looks around sees Metreon scowls and like delicately extricates himself from the weird kind of contraption they put together I'll say too that uh, Metreon is a very wild sleeper, so it's <laughs> like he would have his arms would have been like crossed over the pillow fort. Uh, his tail probably would have whipped you at some point, but uh, and he snores very loudly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Erthrindir is going to slightly spitefully take one of the pillows from the pillow wall and just cut, or he's going to no, he's going to slightly spitefully take one of the pillows from beneath Metreon's head and put it on his side, and then just kind of head out of the room. Alright, so who is meeting in the foyer? 
Uh, Kiva will go as soon as she's awake and, and ready. Amity will go, uh, assuming you wake her up. Oh yeah, she'll make sure that Amity is awake and able to use the, the crutch to get downstairs. Mm -hmm. Though Truffle can keep continue sleeping. Well, listen, pokes her head out just far enough from the kitchen to watch everybody. Um, instead of sleeping, she appears to have gotten her book out and uh, is, you know, in the middle of writing something in it. Have a good night. Be careful. Of course. He's gonna meet Amity and Kiva in the foyer. Y'all ready? As I'll ever be. Okay. Amity, let us know if you need a shoulder. Th this will be practice. Um, yeah. Using it. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why. I feel so compelled to do this. You're curious, and also I'm pretty sure it's a natural shock response. Kind of, you know, once you get past the horror, then you know you kind of want to see what's going on. And I'm sure it'll make for a great story for both of you. <laughs> ah, man, the histor this the history of this one is going to be something. People aren't going to believe it. I mean, they already don't believe the stuff I put out, but like, more so. Th they won't believe well, in the way they can laugh at me. You don't think ghosts and vampires and countries you can't leave are believable? <laughs> eh, not the kind of people I sell histories to, unfortunately. I never want to tell the story. It's not a bad choice. I, I mean, what do you think the lesson was? Don't. He kind of starts and then stops. I think the lesson is that the world is pretty awful place sometimes. Let's go. Alright. And so with that, the three of you make your way out from the mansion together, closing the door behind you, and for a moment you think you see Irina watching you from the top of the stairs, and then the door closes and the sight of her vanishes. You continue forward, making your way along the roads, passing the mansion behind, and once more into the dreary drizzle of the Barovian air beyond. Soon enough, the broken hulk of the manor leaves you behind. When you pass through the dark, light rainfall through the streets as the moon's ever waxing rises further in the sky toward its arch at the top. You pass through the streets doing your best to follow what directions you had gleaned over dinner toward where the cemetery lies, passing through the north avenue of the town, passing by the entrance to the place before where you had found the tavern and then heading further away until you come upon an old church. The church you find here, you see atop a slight rise against the roots of the pillar stone that supports Castle Ravenloft above, you see standing a gray sagging edifice of stone and wood this church has obviously weathered the assaults of evil for centuries on end and is worn and weary. A bell tower rises toward the back and flickering light shines through holes in the shingled roof. The rafters strain feebly against their load. Beyond it, you can see something additional as well. Peering beyond the edge of the church, you can see the space beyond it, a fence of wrought iron 
with a rusty gate enclosing a rectangular plot of land behind the dilapidated church. Tightly packed gravestones shrouded by fog bear the names of souls long past, and here all seems quiet. towards the entrance to the graveyard. Did she say what exactly we should be looking for? She didn't want to. I guess we'll find out then. Yeah. And yeah, he'll approach the entrance and take a look around. You make your way forward. The gate to the graveyard is not incredibly difficult to make your way through. It creaks and groans with a faint shriek as you make your way inside. You pass inside the interior of the fence and make your way through the graveyard. The old headstones standing silently amongst the rows of sod and muddy earth. Overhead, the moon seems nearly ripe to reach its apex of the night. Well, there's the place. I, uh, <laughs> guess we just wait. And pray nothing starts crawling out of these graves. Is, from these symbols on the side, can I see who the church is uh, dedicated to? Uh, make a religion check for me. On it. 19. 19. The iconography of the sunbursts that you see seem somewhat reminiscent of uh, icons of certain uh, deities of the morning or of the sun. Um, you're reminded briefly of the icons of uh, Lathander that you've seen in other towns, the god of the dawn, but these are slightly different. They're, they seem to be sunbursts with the center hollow, the depictions of Lathanders are usually a rising dawn. It's a slight difference in iconography that make you wonder if it's this exact same deity, though it seems to be devoted to a god of some sort of sun or morning. It's... A few minutes pass. Are you... Sorry, Amity? Um, go ahead. Is there anything else you'd like to say, or are you just going to settle back and wait? I think Arthrin Deer's good. He's a little too spooked to make small talk. Likewise. Right. With that, you settle back in, leaning against the walls of the church or the fence, as you might find most comfortable. The thin drizzle continuing to fall as the darkness suffuses the night overhead. A few minutes pass. Five, then ten. Not but you alone with the mist and the dead in the graveyard. And then... An eerie green light suffuses the graveyard. Arthur Deer is immediately on his guard, just yank, like half tracing the glyph for Firebolt in the air as he stumbles backward. Kiva's got her sword drawn, and she's sort of also holding the shield up in uh, in a protective way. Hemity's just watching. You notice that the moon is at its perfect apex overhead, midnight. And as you watch, from this eerie green light emerges a ghostly procession. Wavering images of doughty women toting great swords, woodwise men with slender bows, dwarves with glittering axes, and archaically dressed mages with beards and strange pointed hats. All these and more march forth from the graveyard their numbers growing by the second. Erthrandir is like almost hyperventilating and he kind of steps to the side of the procession as best he can and just looks at Mamity, his eyes wide. I, what, what, 
who are these are these the people that came here before us there are so many of them it can't it can't be I did what do you mean What's hello it? Emily calls out uh, uh, my name is Amity who, who are you as, as far as you can tell, the spirits pay you no heed. They continue marching forth, and as you watch the head of the procession, they begin to march through the closed cemetery gate, passing through it as if there is nothing there. And as you watch, they begin to make their way down the road, passing around the corner of the church and making their way into town. As you watch, the head of the procession slowly turns out of sight, and the others continue to follow in their wake. What the hell? They... that... I... D by Erythrindir's estimation, does the number of corpses... Does, does the number of spirits that he saw match up with about how many graves are in the graveyard? Looking over the graveyard, it seems that there are far more spirits here than could be housed in this cemetery. There's got to be... I mean, there are a few dozen headstones in the graveyard at a quick count. There must be nearly a hundred ghosts marching forth. Well, we've got two options. One, this place is on a catacomb system where you only get your grave plot for a little bit of time, which is actually very common and good land management. But uh, number two is that that's more people than should be here. Period. Not that that particularly helps anyone, but, you know, the more you know. Maybe it's just an illusion, then, and these people aren't actually ghosts at all. Have we ever been that lucky in the past few days? All right, point taken. The figures. What races were they? As far as you can tell, and by this point, the last of the procession has marched forth. There, You saw elves, you saw humans, dwarves. You think you saw one that might have been of orcish descent. You saw a few halflings marching forth. It's an incredibly motley and varied crew. Any tieflings? You did see uh, one or two tieflings, yes. We should follow them. All right, but if they go out of town, we leave them be. Agreed. Yeah, he'll do so. Together and doing your best to keep Amity moving more briskly for fear of the spirits leaving you behind, you make your way through the dark streets following the spirits along as they process like the grave through the empty streets of Barovia. As you watch, they march, taking a right fork when they reach the first intersection out of the church and proceed further, making their way past the boarded up dark homes and structures. You follow them for a few minutes more, and as you watch, they take another right turn and begin marching down the road to the southwest of town. In the distance, you think you could see the dark silhouette of the Burgomaster's mansion, faintly illuminated by the silvery light of the moon on the southern edge of town, but the spirits pay it in you no mind as they proceed down the road away from Barovia and further into the valley beyond. As you watch, you hear the fluttering of leathery wings and a soft chirping and on the edges of the buildings around you, you see a few dozen bats hanging, perched upside down from the roofs. Glancing over them, they seem to be watching you intently as you yourselves watch the procession move past. Arthrandir is going to look at the others and say, in a very small voice, I, 
I know I said this in the house, but we're going to die here, aren't we? Kiva looks very carefully over at Amity and um, then back at Earth and Deer and just I, nods silently, but she doesn't want to say it out loud. He looks back. Go you're, ahead. You're going to say that a lot. I guess I am. But you haven't said it in the same place twice yet. <laughs> That is an alarmingly good point. And he kind of looks at looks at her hair sodden and kind of matted to his face despite the circumstances and despite himself grins. You know, as far as companions for utter and pressing death, destruction, and horror goes, you're not a bad spot, Amity. I'm Glad we're friends. Me too. Where's the procession going? As far as you can see, and they now have continued perhaps a quarter mile down the road, you can see them continuing further in the distance. You recall seeing a river winding its way to the southwest of town. As you watch, they continue marching down, passing plains and grassland, marching toward the dark silhouette of the forest beyond. We should get home. Last thing any of us need is a cold. I, I want to see where they're going. And you've already suffered a several near-death experiences today. Right, sorry. I'm not your father. I'm... Do what you like. But I'm going home. And he looks at Kiva. You coming? Um, I don't know that I should uh, leave her alone just in case something happens. Can can you get back okay? Yeah. Yeah, I can. And as he and as he walks away from them, he's going to trace another elven glyph in the air. This one longer and incredibly complex, and cast invisibility. All right, the two of you watch as a thin mist rises from the air, wisping its way around Aetherndir in a soft spiral, covers him like a veil, and then he winks out of existence. He goes home. How long does Amity stay here? Um, at least like 10 minutes watching them, but if they're still going after that, I guess she'll trace back to the uh, spooky smashed windows house but continue watching from the windows all right and with that the lot of you one by one kiva accompanying amity erith and deer before the others make your way back to the house and together as amity watches the procession slowly retreating into the darkness you return to your rest and there gather for the night. And so. Metreon. E. As the pillow is yanked up below your head, as Erthrandir leaves, though you don't know it, you feel yourself falling for a moment and jolt awake, your eyes snapping open. Some discomfort, you look outside, seeing it's still dark, and then slowly do your best to get back to sleep. But sleep comes more difficult the second time. And as you rest, you find yourself tossing and turning the blankets over you, feeling heavy and stifling. Eventually, however, you feel yourself falling once more into nothingness, and sleep takes you unawares. The space behind your eyelids is dark. It 
pulses throbbing with heat each time your heart beats, and slowly, as your thoughts drift through this shapeless abyss, a shape begins to take form before you. A silhouette. It's at this time that you realize that you are floating, though you do not know where or how. You look down and you cannot see your arms or legs. There's only the shapeless void, shadows twisting in the dark around you. The silhouette's shape resolves into a humanoid form, tall and gaunt, its features entirely covered in a dark, night-black cloak. Its hood drapes over its face like a shroud, cloaking its visage in impenetrable shadow. Then it speaks, its voice quiet and smooth as silk. Yes, you shall suffice. Suffice with what? Where am I? You are beyond the mists, though not physically. Although I believe that you wish to be beyond them in person, do you not? Yeah, yeah. How do I how do I get my body back? Uh, can it can can it come out too? I am afraid not. Even this is my own hand reaching through the fog. But I can offer assistance in what you're seeking. If you seek freedom and escape, then there are those willing to help. Who? Well, myself, personally, I would be willing to offer you the freedom you crave and the power to choose your own path from these dreary mists in exchange for certain services, you understand. Who are you? I... <laughs> hmm, Metreon... My dear, secrets have power, I'm sure you know. If you must know, and the entity reaches forward and you see a bony hand, pale, white, not a strip of flesh upon it, slowly reach out to caress your cheek. I am sure that you know that secrets have power, but if you prove yourself a trustworthy partner, you shall have what you seek. After all, we are very much alike. We both understand the value of secrets, don't we, Punch? Metreon lets this entity touch his cheek, and when he says that name, his body seizes up. <sighs> How you get in my head like that? The bony hand withdraws and vanishes beneath the cloak. If you are to know more of this arrangement and how it came about, you must prove yourself reliable. If you accept my offer, I shall see to it that you have more information. If you are open to it, I will describe the services that I seek. I assure you, you shall not find them intolerable. How do I... Yeah, but I mean, how do I even know that... It, that yeah, you could get into my head, but how do I know that you could get me out of here? Some things you will have to take on faith. And there's a soft, humorless chuckle. But suffice it to say that the power that I shall grant you in exchange for this bargain will be... It should suffice as a down payment, perhaps. Metron takes a moment, shuts his eyes takes a deep breath what do you want I may ask for more in time but for now what I ask of you is to watch to listen and to wait observe your surroundings observe the truth that they hold and 
from time to time I may call upon you to share them. Of the many things that you have found in this land, there is one that does intrigue me. And while I wish your eyes and ears remain open, I would ask that you focus on one in particular to begin. What's that? The woman you know as Lillicent. Much occurred in the time that you were separated beneath Durst House. I would ask you to uncover the events that took place and the nature of any entities you may or she may have encountered. Without tipping your hand, of course. Right. I could, I could do that. And, and I'll do that and you get me out of here. That's the deal, yeah? That is the deal. That is the beginning of the services I shall ask, but in time I shall ensure that you are advanced to a position where your escape is within your reach. If you continue your side of our arrangement ship, the means of your escape shall be revealed to you. Is that sufficient? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Just, just whatever you could do, get me out of here. Uh, I can't be here no more. The entity nods beneath its dark, impenetrable hood and slowly reaches out a bony hand. I believe it is custom of your people to shake on these manners of agreements. Metreon takes another deep breath and glares into the darkness before looking down at his palm. He spits in it and extends it. The creature's hand is cold. But as you take it, the entity nods beneath its cloak and says, Very good. You shall know what to do when you awaken. And to answer your question, you may call me the Wounded One. And slowly you watch as the darkness begins to gather around it, its shape growing blurry and more difficult to make out. When you awaken, you will know what to do. I look forward to your reports. The darkness comes forward, surrounding this thing like a nimbus, a cocoon of shadow. And then you are once more floating in the void. And then your eyes snap open. You sit bolt upright in bed. And from what you can see, you are once more in the Burgomaster's mansion. But now you are soaked in sweat, your forehead burning your entire body trembling and shaking. On the other side of the bed, you can see Erethrindir once more, eyes quietly closed, the trance taking him. And then you feel rising up an image in your mind, a small black circle, an icon. This small circle nestled within a larger hollow circle that is itself surrounded on the bottom, the left and the right by outward pacing triangles and bordered on the top by three thin lines that point up. You feel this image perfectly in your mind and then your hand slowly twitching toward your chest, the left hand slowly twitching toward your pack where you know your tattoo kit to lie you know what you have to do. You feel the canvas upon your chest and on your back and your shoulders, on your arms, and you know that somewhere the sigil is waiting to be engraved. Yeah, uh, thankfully Metreon doesn't rely on uh, light too much thanks to the dark vision. Uh, so he rummages through his sack and pulls out the, the inkwell and the quill that he stole from Durst Manor. He sits on the floor and uh, just continuing to look down. He uh, and he sleeps shirtless anyway, so he begins to uh, stick and poke with the quill, uh, dipping in it 
back and forth in the ink, and he begins to outline, at least, the sigil that he has seen so clearly in his head. It comes easily. You've already got a practiced hand at this, but now it comes flowing like water. The design flowing forth as though a muse is singing its very outline to you. And as it does, you see yourself making advances, arrangements, as your thoughts are guided almost by the channel of your thoughts. The three lines atop the symbol spiraling and splitting into a flowing runic cursive script. And as each one does, you feel a note of power in the back of your head forming and consolidating into knowledge from beyond. Where it comes, you cannot say, but you feel the keys, the triggers in your mind. And as each flowing spiral ends engraved with tiny intricate runes, you feel the string of power solidify and tighten in the back of your head, waiting to be pulled. It's not long, no more than an hour before the task is done. Your chest breathing hard, still soaked in sweat, but the tattoo now engraved. And where has he placed this tattoo? Uh, well, uh, it seemed to be uh, as if his it, it was something over his heart uh, was kind of calling to him. So he he places it there. He actually blasts over some of the older work that's on it, um, giving it little consideration for this seemingly more important uh, sigil. All right. And so the tattoo is engraved, the sigil implanted upon your skin, and the spirals split as you feel your mind buzzing with knowledge and potential and power. And then you feel tired and you feel slowly your eyes closing and lulling you back to sleep as the shadow takes you. And with your work done, you return to your rest. And that is where we will end it for today. So that was not sketchy at all. Hey, Dragna. What the Stop. fuck? Yeah. I, yeah, no, that's a that that's 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 all I have left to say. Yeah, the eternal question, Dragna. What the fuck? About to lose my damn mind. I assume Metreon is like level one warlock now or something. Who knows? Who knows? Well, this is gonna be interesting. Yeah. This will not bite us in the ass later. I am sure of it. <laughs> Absolutely excited. nothing happened in that basement. I can answer that right now. <laughs> nothing yeah. happened in that basement. Metreon's had a great night's sleep. So that's all, yep. all, that's all anyone needs to know right now. <sighs> also, right. Dragna, would you mind like showing a, a picture of that sigil? Yeah, for sure. Uh, at, I some will, point, at some point. I will ensure that it is distributed DM via the Discord Twitter. Thank Could you. you actually just DM it to and yes, me? I will. <laughs> yes, I will do that first. Never fear. Thank you. You will have first dibs. Bless. That was awesome. Bless. So the, that's the t that's the tattoo we're all getting for the twice bitten tattoo group, right? Like we all. That's cool with everyone. Yeah, yeah all obviously. of our subs have to get too. So yeah, um, just be prepared for that subs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, that's why Serena has been handing out gift subs. <laughs> yes, <laughs> more of us to get tattoos. <laughs> Bring on the ink. No. <laughs> well, consider it. I can, put a, I can on... draw something with a magic marker on my hand or something. It d yeah, d d depends on the uh, the level spells that we get. I might consider it. The sigil mm -hmm. is just actually like two dolphins like in a sunset. It's one of those really old like cheesy it's sailor actually a tattoos. Yin -yin. It's a yin-yin. Yin <laughs> I love you, mom. Dolphin. No, it's that It's that um that funky S shape. Oh, oh yeah! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, that's yes. it. It's just the coolest. <laughs> that's what those three lines were, so I can start making a stussy all over my body. Uh, yeah. Wow. Oh, huh. Thought I knew everything that would happen this campaign. Nope. Absolutely not. not. Gotta keep you guessing. And on that note. <laughs> and on that note, I think we're all through for today. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, we will see you all back in the mists next Saturday. Uh, until then, keep your doors locked and your windows shuttered, and take care. <laughs>